Shack on a hill in the mossy creek bottoms of Cane Creek, Arkansas. This is Lighting the Void once again, and I'm your host, Joe Roop. It is Thursday. I'm sorry, it is Tuesday, October the 8th. I don't even know what day it is. And tonight, our brother from the void, Jason Quitt, is back on the show. I want to thank all of you for coming out and listening to us live on the broadcast here, live on the Fringe FM. We weren't here last night. We had to reschedule because I was so... I mean, exhausted from the conference. Our guest said he wasn't feeling really well either, and so now we're just kicking things off on a Tuesday night and uh, right here in uh, the middle of October with Jason Quit. The one and only Jason Quit is here with us again tonight. I want to thank all of you that came out to the conference this weekend. A big, big shout-out to Nick uh, and a couple of people apparently that I missed because apparently I spent too much time at the food truck. That's what was going on. I, I heard that from a couple of people that uh, I would make great escapes to the food truck, and I missed a few other listeners that came to see me. But I did get your email, and I'm very sorry uh, that I missed you. Also got to see Sammy. Sammy showed up with Steve and uh, gave me a nice gift, so that was great. And Lady Anne from the Caravan of Lore was also there. She made quite a few friends while she was there, too. So we had a really good time while we were there. And... um Next year, I hope to see more of you, and thank you all for coming out, and especially to you too, Nick. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for buying a hat, too, the next day. I noticed that you did that, and uh, I do want to take time, because I don't do this enough, to to thank the people that support the show. But real quick, i got to tell you, though, that this show is brought to you by GetTheTea.com. Make sure you get cleansed. Make sure you keep yourself you know, guarded from those intruders. We've also got a new supplement I want you to check out, D365. It's really good stuff. Just in case you don't have your tea with you, you're on the go, or you're going to travel like I did. It's in pill form, and you can still keep cleansed with that, too, and it works almost as good as Super Strength Tea. You can check it out. There's a big special right now at at GetTheTea.com. GetTheTea.com. Also, AncientLifeOil.com, the best CBD oil on the planet and preparewiththefringe.com. Make sure you go there. Don't get caught unawares. Anything over 100 bucks gets you free shipping there as well. So um, I want to give a shout-out to our supporters. And this is I need to do this more, actually, uh, just to give you say hi and to say thank you, um, especially to Catherine uh, because she doubled down because she just felt that she needed to. I got that email as well. I got a ton of emails today, man. I was really moved by all of the support that we get. Uh, Barney, who's, you know, still feels like he's got a support, even though he's living, he's probably going to be living off uh, disability, like he said in Facebook. There's a lot of people that have to go through with that. And then, you know, if you're going through that, man, just sharing the show and and inviting people uh, to the pages and stuff, that's, that's good support too. But here's a quick shout-out to all the donors is Patrick, Larry, um, Catherine, Craig, Nick, uh, Tamala, Joseph, looks like Jennifer, Suzanne, uh, Barbara, Mark. I don't know if I can say your last name, so I'm just going to say your first name. Uh, Lynn, Tammy, Amanda, Amandala. 
Amanda, Randolph, Robert, Stephen, David, uh, Andy, Ellen, Travis, Debbie, Joe, Philip. Hold on. I'm waiting on the rest of the list here. Also, my, our brothers, Grimerica, for sending us a shout out over here. Jared, uh, Katie, and I think Larry. I think I got all of you. If I didn't, let me know, and I'll give you a shout out too soon soon enough also make sure you guys go give ufo seekers a follow on twitter that's where you can keep up with all the (laughs) all the wonderful conversations about what's going on in the field of ufology and i know that my voice may sound a little weird and the reason why that is is because i've been trying to get this thing ready uh for the broadcast since i got home well actually i was working on some other things too but realized hey you know my levels are not good and so I might sound like a robot in a can right now. I don't know. But we're still going to do the show. And uh, Jason is here with us. And if for some reason you don't know who Jason Quid is, I'll let you know. But before we do that, uh, please give UFO Seekers a follow on Twitter. If you have a sighting that you'd like to report, also go to the website. You can do that there. You can give them a call, too, at the number. And that is 661-UFO-7889 if you've had a sighting. And go check out their new season on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash UFO Seekers. Now, Jason Quitt is a graduate of the Institute of Energy Wellness and a student of Algonquin, Algonquin, shamanism. Jason has been training and working with many teachers, shamans, and traditional healers from around the world. And he's also the author and teacher of Egyptian Postures of Power and the Yosef Codes, which are methods of personal healing and practice. And as a channel channeler of universal and dimensional energies of healing he combines these methods and modalities of energy medicine shamanism and dowsing to assist those on their own personal paths of healing and enlightenment he's currently working on tesla magazine tesla mania exposition and the healing field documentary and you can check out his website at the jason man it's good to have you back thanks for coming on Thanks for having me back, and I got to send you an updated uh, introduction as well. Of course, man. We always blow the <laughs> intro. I love it. I, I love it when I get done with that intro, and there's like, yeah, that's not quite right. But thanks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's always good to be back on this show, and uh, we always have some great conversations here. And I guess we were both at a conference this weekend. Yeah, which one did you go to? I went to uh, Portal to Ascension um, in Irvine, California. Yeah, see, that's a big one. I always go to the little ones where I can hide by the food truck and not get in trouble for it, you know. Um, Portal to Ascension, that's a pretty big one, though, isn't it? Uh, yeah, we had uh, Travis Walton. Uh, we had um, we had Whitley uh, Strieber and uh, who else? Billy Carson, John D'Souza, nice. and a bunch of others. It was a, it was a pretty great uh, conference. Yeah, did you learn anything or did you teach a whole lot of stuff? A little of both. 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 Um, luckily, and, and what I've been doing now at conferences is I've been sitting and listening to everybody. Usually, you know, you're stuck behind a table or something in another room. But fortunately, I was in the room the whole time. So I got to hear everyone, which is really good. You learn a lot. <laughs> well, I I definitely agree with that. I've learned quite a bit from just from people you know it's like like no offense to guests or anybody that come on this program i mean you're one of my favorite guests you know that man you know that but i learn so much from everybody's experience it's insane it really is i learned way too much from just people's ordinary stories that i always think man you got to talk to some guru of this kind or that kind to learn something and you can just sit down with anybody that's willing to share their experience with you especially when it comes to the paranormal or consciousness exploration or ufology and it never fails to i learn something new every time it seems like yeah and everybody has a piece so i find that even if i'm listening to someone that i may not entirely agree with there's always something in their presentation where i was like wow um that's pretty amazing and it uh, fits into some other uh things So, you know, always listen to others' experience. Yeah. Well, you've taught me a lot, too, on the show, man. Uh, I remember one of our first conversations, I was telling you about all of the things that I was frustrated with in this field, right? Mainly 
ufology and some of the things that are happening and you were one of the first people to tell me live on air to, to kind of call me out and say well look maybe you don't know know the whole situation maybe you're not being compassionate enough and so this is something that uh, i wanted to kind of start with and i wanted to talk to you a little bit more about how energy relates to consciousness exploration but the compassion thing is something that i think we need to really uh look at um but i sometimes wonder jason just how much how uh, where is the healthy cutoff there right i mean when you're giving compassion to people uh whether they're i don't know um emailing you or trying to get your attention i guess what i'm trying to say is how much is enough until you say okay i'm done Mm -hmm given the compassion or being vamped off of here because you start to feel like uh you're you're given too much because that's kind of what i'm going through in in multiple scenarios well i would just say you have to kind of look at yourself first there's Uh only there's only so much so much that you can take uh, in your daily life and um you know unfortunately or fortunately i don't know how you would look at it but um when or once I put out the book and, you know, being on social media, you get uh, bombarded every single day right. um, with, with questions and emails. And in this community, and I'll, you know, I'll call it this community, um, to be public in, into it and to be there for people is very difficult because uh, it's not my full time job. You know, it so it's that way, don't it sometimes it. it it does. It does. And I feel, I feel bad sometimes when things pile up and you don't answer a question. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, you get a very angry email saying, now I know who you really are because you didn't even take the time to read my email. And I'm thinking, you know, I can barely, you know, call my mother or eat food The you know, life, sometimes you have to, you know, do your daily job and then on the side, check up on uh, the stuff that's going on online. And hopefully you could make people happy that way. Yeah. But that, there come. No, go ahead. I'm, I'm just saying there comes a point where um, you have to kind of step back and recharge your own batteries. Mm-hmm. Because if you start to deplete yourself and just give your energy to every single person, you're going to become sick. And it's going to take away from your life. And then you're not going to be able to help anyone um, or yourself because your energy is too thin. You're giving your energy away to every single person that comes your way. So you have to find that uh, balance. And I and just hope that um, people will understand that, you know, um, you have a life, too. And it takes a lot of energy out of you to really read and go over and think really hard how do we respond um, to these people's questions uh, with the compassion that it is needed you know yeah i get what you're saying and you yourself you you know you're an author you go to conferences uh you get bombarded with emails like you're talking about but you also you're a family man too right you're married you're a family man and i think you have to I think there takes some incredible wisdom in that to learn how to uh, um, balance that properly, right? I mean, there has to be. It doesn't seem easy. I have a hard enough time uh, keeping up with everything I got to keep up with just on the work side, so I can't imagine everything else sometimes, you know? And I think one of the biggest lessons in life that I've learned about energy, and especially from you and what you've talked to me about, is learning balance and trying to find that balance. Exactly. And if you don't, um, you're just going to become sick, really. Like it's just it's that simple. Uh, Your body will start to say enough is enough and you'll feel fatigued. uh, You'll have mind fog and then you'll start making mistakes. So we really have to kind of focus in on ourselves and try to work on ourselves. And I think we need to take time every single day um, outside of family, outside of business where we can just kind of sit in our, be it meditation or be it something we enjoy, let's say like uh, reading or making music or doing artwork or even walking um, outside, going for a walk in the forest. We need something 
at least like a half an hour to an hour a day where you say, I'm cutting out the entire world. This is me time. Yeah. And, and that's what we need to do. Yeah, man. That's, see, that's why, uh, do you have one of those, uh, tool sheds yet where you go? Like if you, you know, you and your wife get into it, you got the man shed, like the bat cave or something like you got to get away. Right. Do you have that in your home? Like everybody uh, else does that they talk about? You know? Yes, yes. Uh, well, my whole life, um, my main interest is music. Awesome. And I've been um, basically making music and playing music my whole life. So right now I have a, a room in my basement that is it's pretty much like a, a studio where I can just go into and pick up a guitar or start programming something. So that's that's my shed. <laughs> nice, right? And t- tell me, it's electronic music, please. Is it? Of course, it's electronic. Yeah. Music. So I saw a picture of you, and and it's not too long ago, but it was a picture of you with a lot of knobs and gadgets and and stuff. And I'm like, oh man, he's doing the dead mouse thing, right? <laughs> Isn't that what you're doing? Because that that looks like fun. It it's a lot of fun. It's a vi- it's a very expensive hobby. Um, you know, most people spend money on vices like alcohol or mm-hmm. drugs or fancy cars. I spend it on uh, electronic music equipment. <laughs> <laughs> that that's that's my addiction. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it you know once you start and you realize that um, to make music like that, it's you need to learn how to use actual gear, and then you have to use real recording devices, and then you're deep in it and you can't get out unfortunately but i have been po- i think i have posted quite a bit of just random uh noodling on on twitter and facebook over the past year i'll post some ideas of tracks up here and there and i post some stuff on the website as well but you know i'm home now for at least uh the winter so I'm going to be uh, producing and hopefully uh, get some more stuff out on the, uh, the on the website. Yeah, well, you know, feel free to throw it my way. I'll throw it up on the station. I mean, it's October, man. It's Halloween month, so we're going to be doing a lot of playing on the station. And, and you never know. You might be the next Dead Mouse. Who, who, who knew Jason Quit would turn into the next big-time DJ? Have you always wanted? I know everybody's like, talk about the aliens, but I'm really cur- <laughs> curious about this. Like, have you always wanted to be on stage like Dead Mouse with just crowds of people waving to your music? Like, how awesome would that be, really? Um, well, I'll just say that um, from the age of 16 to 27, I, I probably played every club in Toronto. Or <laughs> Really? What was yeah. your DJ name? Did you tell me this already? Cause I'm, no, I no, bad. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't, uh, DJ, um, growing up, I was in a, I'll call it a, a heavy metal band and I was the guitarist. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I can't I, see I, that. I don't, know I why. know I can't see it either, but I did it. <laughs> well, did, so did you play like lead or rhythm or bass or what? Uh, mostly I played uh, rhythm. Wow. And, uh, but you know, you add enough distortion and you down tune to a D, and every, everything sounds perfect. So yeah, it does. <laughs> it sounds great. <laughs> but you had some fun. That's cool, man. I, I wish I could have saw saw that. That would have been and, epic. And then I morphed into um, I played for a synth pop band, and then I was playing guitar. It was kind of like a Depeche Mode, The Cure kind oh. of band. Deep. And <laughs> yeah, and I I played the guitar, and then I moved into keyboards and then from there i went straight to just programming electronic music and i got into everything from edm to hip-hop to house to drum and bass uh you name you name it i i did it so but you know it was just a hobby I i didn't i didn't do it for money i didn't do it for wanting to tour or anything like that i just did it you know, to make me happy and, you know, I'll send it to my friends. That's, that's basically what I did. Yeah. I, that's, I think I can relate to you cause you like figuring stuff out and then playing with it after you figure it out. That's how I am too with technology, especially. And, uh, 
I use Ableton Live and and play around with that quite a bit. But um, uh, all right. So I just want everybody to know first and foremost before we get into the consciousness exploration and energy and out of body stuff and healing and all that, that Jason Quid is a normal dude that likes to rock. Right. So there you go. Um, you're a normal dude that likes to rock. Right. Are you over all that now? No, I. In fact, the older I get, the more I have to get back because. I'm telling you, there's something to music. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I remember growing up and let's say um, my energy wasn't good. You know, I was depressed or, you know, just something wasn't right. I would grab my acoustic guitar, jump into bed and just kind of play whatever came up. And just that resonance, that sound vibrating within that hollow guitar, um, it, 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 it did something to me like I could feel the instant changes, and I believe that when we uh, listen to music or make music, we're activating parts of the brain that um, we usually don't activate, and I believe they are very powerful spiritual gates that really activate us. So I, I really believe that music is a gateway, a doorway to consciousness itself, and that's why I love it so much. You know, something I found also that I found out through this weekend that is incredibly inspiring was, uh, and I know this is going to sound sappy maybe or a little silly, but in, so I was with Lady Anne from the Caravan of Lore this weekend and uh, she likes to go touring, right? So I said, well, we'll take you to the airport, but before we do that, Let's check out some places here in in Little Rock, right? And so we went to the Capitol and went to the train station and uh, went to a couple other places. And then I knew I always kind of liked this stuff, like art and museums and sculptures and stuff like that. I, I knew there was something to it. But now, you know, I used to feel that when I was a kid, when I watched plays and I grew up and... I went to a few, and I've always wanted to go to more to explore that, right? I always wanted to explore that more. Well, I really got to this yesterday, or Sunday. I really got to explore that a lot, and it started opening up things for me that I hadn't felt in a long time, you see. And I wonder if it's not just music, if it's more like that whole right brain thing that people talk about when you're when you're tapping into the arts of any kind, that really touches the soul you know yeah and once we like like i go out and give uh, personal uh, talks at these conferences all the time or you know i speak on the radio if you're speaking completely um fact-based logical uh i'll say like reference-based information it's all left brain and it takes a lot for your uh, consciousness to remember all those things. So basically after three to five minutes of listening to pure left brain talk, you kind of shut out and forget what you're listening to, unless it's like super, super exciting. <laughs> but when you're speaking from the right ba- or the right brain, when you're talking about experience, emotions, how it felt, um, personal experience, um, You can hold a person's attention span for hours because when you're activating that right brain awareness, it's almost like the receiving side. You're receiving information. You're receiving energies. um, And for some reason, the left brain, it's a very difficult thing to program. Because it doesn't, it feels like it's already programmed, right? I mean, is that the thing about it, that it's already so full of, programs or are we talking about the subconscious here again because i feel like everything starts in the mind now i could be wrong about this all right and uh this past sunday kind of showed me that i could be wrong about it but in my experience in studying hermetics like everything that we do or everything that happens as a reaction to our behavior starts in the mind i feel like in some way uh and so I, if, I, go ahead yeah Oh, I would just say that um, we should usually we should change the definition of what we're talking about from mind to awareness, because I think it's not we think of the mind as like this logical thing where we're taking in information. But really, what is a mind? It's being aware 
of your surroundings and taking in the information from your environment. And basically language and everything that we are doing is just a way for us to understand where we live, how to survive our environment. So it's really this awareness. And if we don't have information, if we don't have this awareness, we don't have really consciousness. That's why if you take, um, let's say, um, a sedative and you pass out, you lose consciousness, you lose complete awareness of everything. And it's until you wake up, you regain that awareness. So I believe that the mind is this kind of first uh, thing that we have to kind of be aware of in that awareness of who we are. And then everything else happens after that awareness. Interesting. So if I have an emotion about something, that starts in my awareness, so to speak. But it doesn't mean my awareness is correct. Uh, And this is what I wanted to get at with you, what I wanted to talk to you about energy. Uh, Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I think we really need to uh, differentiate um, or maybe I just need a better definition of what we're feeling as far as energetically goes or what we're, or if it's something that's in our mind, like something that's in our subconscious that causes us to feel a certain way, like a program or something. And we think, um, that that's our energy and see, I'm still exploring this whole thing, this idea of energy, man. That's one of the reasons why I have you on here to talk to you about is because I don't think it's as simple as everybody makes it out to be. I really think no. it has a lot more to do with consciousness than anything. I would say, you know, what we're talking about tonight and what you're bringing to the table is very, very complex, actually. It's it's not as simple as just the mind. You know, does the mind feel the emotions? Is the emotions correct from, for the, from the experience? Um, there's a lot to this. And I'll start off by saying um, the mind is very logical. So I remember like when I was going through my awakening process, um, I would like wake up in the morning and I'd be so depressed. I'd feel like I'm going to cry, yeah, but it, does, it doesn't make any sense. So it's like, like my logical mind is, is telling me, why do I feel this way? This does not make any sense. I don't understand why I feel this way, but I do feel this way. Mm-hmm. So there's this type of disconnection from the mind has no awareness of why I feel a certain way. And I always thought that um, just from personal experience, I always blame myself as in I'm feeling this because there's something wrong with me. Right. Yeah, that's sad, though, man, like because I've, I've experienced that with friends and stuff, and I don't think. I think that word wrong is so harsh, man, you know, Mm. like it's just, do you really felt that though? Like something, did you feel like something was wrong with you? Yeah, because there was no other explanation. So the mind is desperately trying to figure out the reasons and the cause. Why do I feel this way? But there was nothing logical about it, you know, and we can get into, um, well, maybe your diet wasn't good enough and, you know, you're have an imbalance in minerals in your body. Therefore, your chemistry is off. So you, it makes you feel that way or you're not getting the right sleep or something's wrong with the EMF in the environment that's causing you to feel this way. But your mind doesn't logically pick it up. Uh, what I realized uh, and it took a long time to figure this out was that um, I was actually very empathic to other people's energies. And I started to realize that I would be picking up energies from the environment Uh and picking up energies from other people, let's say my friends, family, or even just going out into the public. And then I would bring those energies back home with me. And I started feeling all these different things. And once I started to realize that um, maybe these energies are not mine, that I'm picking them up from others. Yeah, that's when this whole other world of energy opened up to me. And this is actually like a shamanic uh, training saying that the energies that we hold may not even be ours, that we're picking it up from others. And then we're accepting it as our reality. Well, then how safe is it out there? Because that makes me feel like, hey, um, we make decisions based on how we feel. 
But if we're not energetically mature, I guess you could say, or understand what's going on, then we could be making decisions based on how others are influencing us. I'm start. I'm just thinking. I know I'm going worst case scenario here, but I'm just thinking safety cost reasons. You know. Well, I would say most people, and it's a very common thing, we make emotional decisions. Don't we all make emotional decisions? Sure. And then we realize, you know, we reacted too fast. <laughs> we made yeah, the decision too fast. All the time, yeah. And uh, this is also something that you have to learn in this type of training, is you have to kind of not react Only if it's obviously for survival, you're going to react, right? But if it's just reacting on an emotion, you have to kind of stop yourself. Mm -hmm. Instead of like reacting um, from the emotional state, you step back and you become an observer and then you use your mind and awareness to kind of figure out the situation before you do anything. Um, And that's very difficult for a lot of people, actually. You know, yeah, yeah, it's extremely difficult for me because... uh, I get to, what do you call it, grumpy, I guess. And uh, if, somebody, if I get triggered, then it's like <clears throat> I have to walk away. Now, what I've learned to do, though, when it comes to that is try to realize what's happening and uh, try to walk away, right? Just try to walk away and then try to catch your breath and see what's going on. But I'm talking specifically about anger here, but that's one that's one emotion. But, yeah, I want to explore this and how it relates to energy and consciousness with uh, Jason Quitt, who's our guest tonight. The Crystalsun.com is the website. You can go check it out for reference. If you want to call in, that number is 1-800-588-0335. We'll be right back. Qualified patients can access medical cannabis in all 50 states. Anasense is a medical cannabis collective that helps patients in all 50 states gain access to cannabis medication. Anasense does this with a streamlined process and strict compliance with the Compassionate Use Act of 1996, the Affordable Care Act, and the U.S. Constitution. It is important for each patient to understand the legalities involved, the costs, and the benefits of cannabis medication. Through truth, legalization, and education, the medical benefits of cannabis will supplant recreation recreational perceptions and the real vision for change will be realized let the people and their personal doctors take control of their medical cannabis decisions before the greed of big business takes over the tipping point for change is today and canasense is ready to lead the charge and enable legal access for all qualified patients to medical cannabis through its proven system for more information go to the fringe.fm forward slash care or click the banner on the website today i think by now we can get the information I love magic, and on Lighting the Void, each and every week, you will get to hear shows about magic, mysticism, and many other subjects that stretch your mind and imagination. So when I got my mind on the magic and the magic on my mind, I listen to Lighting the Void on the Fringe FM. It's magic. May the gods look with favor upon you. You're wondering what we're going to do to you, guys. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER, stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on 
on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation, and Angioprim is the result. A safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now to Angioprim.com. That's A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M.com. Or to speak with a trained consultant, give Angioprim a call at 954-882-7221. That's 954-882-7221. Come, walk through the mossy creek and up the hill. Never mind the flashing lights and otherworldly shadows. They stay hidden within the trees. Come, step up to the shack and begin your journey to the answers that you seek. This is Lady Anne, and you are listening to Lighting the Void on the Fringe FM. Okay, here we go. Ancientlifeoil.com. Ancientlifeoil.com. Now, this is for CBD. Ancientlifeoil.com. Again, for CBD. Where do I get CBD? Ancientlifeoil.com. It's pretty good stuff. Organic, non-GMO. We are the Ferrari of CBDs. Ancientlifeoil.com. You know, they say when you mention a person's name three times when you first meet that you're going to remember. So I'd say to you, nice to meet you, Ancientlifeoil.com. It's Ancientlifeoil.com, right? Nice to know that you help people. Ancientlifeoil.com. Think about this. Occasional stress, occasional anxiety, occasional inflammation, occasional stiffness, and intruders that get you down. Ancientlifeoil.com. Okay, so I'm going to give you a fact for the day. So Ancient Life Oil does not help you with business deals. Hold on a second. If you feel better, it could help you make a better decision. Okay, I'm wrong. Just remember to go to ancientlifeoil.com. All right, everyone. This is Justin from the UK. Excuse the chitty chitty. If you're into the fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks, me old China plate, Joe Roop, and his guests on Light in the Void will open your mince pies. You need to shut your north and south and use your 10 speed gears and listen to them bubble. You could hear a Barry Crocker, no Brussels, but he ain't no holy friar. Anyway, you beat a Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. to Lighting the Void. The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at 501-777-5631. Well, it has been said by many or a few and I'll say it too, I don't care how egocentric it sounds, I start to believe it after a while that the so-called truth community doesn't really want to hear the truth. And we've had a running pattern on this show for the past uh, month and a half about shadow work. And believe you me when I say that this is not coming from a tower, not the dark tower, because I've done some myself. And uh, I think, Jason, when we, we want to talk about consciousness and energy and how we're being manipulated energetically and all of these things. We have to be able to look at the darkest parts of ourself and say, okay, now I'm really doing some truth seeking here, right? That's when you, I think when you really are doing some truth seeking, when you look at your behaviors and what the cause and effect of everything is for real, you know? Yeah. And you know, my whole teachings and the way I was brought up is that the healing journey is you know, really going deep and going, walking in the shit. Uh, sorry. Yeah, you can say <laughs> shit. You get away with one shit on the program, at least, you know, it's All right. okay. Well, basically you have to walk through that to get to the other side. So you have to really go where you're uncomfortable and mm. you have to look really deep at yourself. You know, a lot of uh, people, they have problems with others and it's just because they're projecting the things they don't want to see in themselves. You know, so you hmm. become the mirror for most people. And that's also an effect of, you know, what we call the um, awakening process is that you will become the mirror 
of other people's projections. And you're going to have to understand that it's coming from them. It's not coming from you. And it's coming to you in a way that's going to push your buttons and see if you're ready to take the next step or not. Do you react or do you understand with compassion what they're trying to do and pull you into? What if you understand what they're trying to do, but you also react? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you get it, but you want to make, see, cause I think boundaries are important and especially for a guy like you, man. I mean, I know you've set boundaries. You've talked to me about that. You've talked to me about boundaries before. You, you, um, ha- you have to, you have to set boundaries. I mean, you know, you can't be a pushover. You can't let people uh, walk all over you or take advantage of you. Because once you allow that to happen, it's going to continue to happen until you put a stop to it. So, you know, when we talk about spirituality, it's not like the love and light and open your arms to everything and everyone. Uh, It's about setting your boundaries and being strong in your boundaries and understanding that um, if you would like to uh, open your energy field up with compassion and help people, you're doing that because it's your choice. Yeah. But if you think that this person is going to come to you and, you know, not heal and just kind of use you for your energy and they don't want to change. And this is a thing that you'll find um, as a healer and with, um, you know, even with friends and family, um, a lot of people, they like where they are. Yes. It, they don't want they don't want to change um even if it's small changes they just won't do it so are you going to continue to feed them your energy and you know think in your heart and mind that yes they will change but you know they're too comfortable taking energy from you sometimes um people need to take responsibility actually i wouldn't say sometimes People just need to take responsibility for their own healing and their own work. And as a a teacher, you know, I'm not going out and teaching people how to um, heal themselves if they don't want to be healed or how to feel their energy if they have no intention of feeling their energy because it's a waste of my energy trying to show somebody or teach somebody something that may help them when they don't want to help themselves. So this is where also setting boundaries are very, very good. And once you have these self, these healthy boundaries set up, um, it's almost like the right people will come to you 10 out of 10 times, you know? Interesting. So, yeah, that's very yeah. interesting. So when you say the right people, do you mean some people will come to you to test you or some people will come to you to help you? Or both? I would say both. I would definitely say both. And, uh, you know, trust me, when I came into this community, um, I, first of all, I've, I've been here for about five years now, I think, about five years. And when I first got into this um, consciousness community, the UFO community, um, I was not like I am right now. I was too open, as in, Every story that I heard, I was like, wow, that's amazing. I totally believe that. Um, You know, even if there was a person that may have had a very bad background, I would say, oh, they've changed. They're really good now because this is the way they're speaking. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you learn very, very fast that, um, you know, just because people say certain things, it doesn't make them who they are. So again, you have to kind of, you know, we talk about discernment, but it's also you have to feel the energy. You can't just listen to words. You know, you have to you have to be in the presence of a person to fully understand where they're coming from. That's right. And I, I remember in this, you know, in this community, when I started to open up my energy field to people, um, they can be standing in a room giving a lecture on love and light type philosophies. But it felt like knives hitting my auric field. Wow. So the words were very, very pretty, very beautiful words being used. But the energy behind the words was not good. So you have to start to kind of develop this other sense of energy so that you can 
understand the difference between uh, words that are healing and words that are uh, taking your energy. And they could be the both same word. Two people could say the word love and one will take the energy and one will give the energy. Yeah, you got that right. Now, here's the thing about that, though. How do we know, and this is what I want to really understand, how do we know that the energy that we're feeling is actual like energy or is it something like a hang up and maybe I've got a miscued or a skewed view of energy, but sometimes I've noticed, uh, people will say, well, it's an energy thing and really it's just a hang up or a subconscious program that is telling them it's an energy thing and they're in safety mode or, uh, and, and you don't want to say anything about it because you know, if you do, it's going to trigger them. But then again, isn't it all just energy? So that's where I get perplexed about the whole thing. I, I'm perplexed right now on <laughs> on this whole setup of this because it's really a personal experience. Gotcha. So one person's experience will be completely different than another person's experience. And everybody's in a very different place. So uh, this is also where compassion comes in as well because, um, you know, I'll just say this. When I first started to go through the awakening process – Uh, The first places I went to were fear. And I got into like really crazy conspiracies like um, uh, reptilians and New World Order and, you know, the elite cabal type stuff, the Illuminati. Like you you get into these really negative fear based conspiracies and you're kind of your consciousness is kind of stuck there for a certain amount of time. And then after learning some things, you pop out of it. And you go somewhere else. But when a person, so basically what I'm saying is that when you're um, going through this awakening process, you see people at many different stages of their um, awakening development, we'll call it. Okay. And in those different stages of awakening, um, it could, they could have various different energies, various different emotions, various different thoughts. And they'll resonate with people in their group, but outside of that, um, they may, they may be very difficult to deal with. Ah, I got you. So, yeah, what I get a lot of questions about is I think more and more people are becoming aware, especially, uh, my audience that they can be influenced by outside energies, by outside, uh, not just things like curses and stuff like that, which you know, are real to an extent of, well, that's a whole other paradigm, I guess, but how to protect yourself from outside influence so that you can be sovereign and make your own decisions and not be influenced so much by other people's energy. What what are the types of things that you do for protection from that? Well, I would first say that, um, it's not just picking up energy from other people. There's also dimensional, energies around us that push our buttons that keep us into patterns and states of being and you know we can call these things entities Um, many of them actually um, are aspects of our family and friends Um, so it comes from living people most of the time and uh, basically these energies could push one of your buttons and you know your family could make you upset very easily right oh they know exactly They know exactly what to say to you at the exact right time for you to explode, right? (laughs) In fact, I've come to realize that it's like the closer you get to someone, the easier it is for them to do that, in my experience. Exactly, because at a subconscious level or this energy level, uh, they're able to pick up on your weakness. So they're actually showing you where you're holding your woundedness, and they can say something or even look at you the wrong way to trigger you into a reaction, an why emotional they, state reaction. Why do the people that are closest to you, why would they want to do that, though? Because I would say there's a law of the universe. It's called hunger. It's as simple as that. Every being has a hunger. And we have hunger. The beings that are connected to us have a hunger. And these entities have a hunger. And they feed off of emotions. They feed off of thoughts on these dimensional levels. 
So they could continually push your button and you will react and produce that energy of anger or fear or guilt or whatever that energy is. And when they do that, then they receive that food or that energy that um, so the people that are the closest to you know you the best, Mm -hmm. basically. But there's a flip side to this as well. So it's not just negative. And this is it took me a long time to learn this. It's not just negative because they're actually showing you what you need to heal. So we all carry these buttons, these traumas, these wounds, these programs in our energetic fields. And what, if, if someone says something to you and it pisses you off or it triggers you, instead of like saying, oh, you know, this person's a jerk and I hate this person, <laughs> say, mm-hmm. wait a second, I shouldn't feel this triggered and I shouldn't react like this. There's something inside of me that's causing me to react in this way. So they're actually bringing this up for you. And once you understand that they're bringing this program up for you, you can actually start to release it. They're showing you what you carry. So there's always a flip side to all these things. Now, um, when I was going through my process, I was being you know, attacked and my energy was being vamped all the time because I became aware of it. And once you become aware of it, then you start to feel um, your energy actually being pulled or hurt in different scenarios. So um, the first thing I started to do was buy crystals. I think that was like the easiest answer um, when it comes to energy is just buy crystals. Okay. For protection? <laughs> so I, for protection. So I would like surround myself in my bedroom. My house was just filled with crystals. I would meditate with crystals. I would, you know, I would have crystals in my pocket in my car and it it was almost like this. Um, it just made me feel good. It was like kind of like my uh, shield of protection when I couldn't protect myself was crystals. And th- and then I got the message that there's no such thing as protection. It's an illusion. Protection is an illusion, and it's just like a quick fix band aid to a problem. So instead of uh, <laughs> You know, instead of stitching up a wound and letting it heal, you're just kind of, you know, putting a cloth over it momentarily when you're using protection. So what they taught me, and when I say they, it's uh, different shamanic teachers, different beings in my out-of-body experiences. Um, They would teach me that you have to strengthen your electromagnetic fields. They say when your electromagnetic fields are weak or distorted or Uh, hurt or damaged, basically you are powerless um, to influence, basically. And they say until until you strengthen and rebuild your energetic matrix, um, you're going to be stuck basically in that level. So it's your responsibility to uh, heal. And this is where I started to go into the meditative uh, practices, the qigongs, uh, learning how to feel and use energy. That's how it started. And it took many years. Like I know I'm talking now about this stuff, but you know I've been doing this for 15 plus years, almost 20 years. And it took most of that time uh, with considerable uh, with a lot of effort to actually learn about energy, to be able to feel, sense, and have the awareness of energy, and then build the energetic fields up again. So we all have this, we can all do this, but um, it takes time. It's like a muscle that we've never used before. And once we get to this strength back to us, um, it's much easier to deal with. And I tell a story, and this is actually in the book, the Forbidden Knowledge book, when um, I was in the shamanic class, the Algonquin shaman class, um, we're sitting in the class, and it felt like a dart flew across the room and hit me. And when this dart hit me, it felt like, uh, it literally felt like a hot coal is stuck on my skin. So it was very painful. 
And I'm trying to like, it's obviously invisible, right? You can't see this. Yeah. I'm trying to like take my hands and grab this thing and pull it off me. And I can't. It's like, it's invisible to me. And then uh, a fellow person in the class who is um, also a shamanic healer, they saw what was happening to me and they just turned over to me with their hand and they went and they just grabbed it right out of my energy field and threw it on the floor. And I immediately felt this person take this dart out of my energy field and the pain was gone instantly. And I was thinking, how come I couldn't do this? How come I couldn't pull this thing out, but this person just reached and pulled it out? It didn't make sense to me until I learned that their electromagnetic field was strong enough to deal with that type of a dart being thrown at me. My energy field was too weak, so I was powerless to it. Oh, okay. That's you know, fascinating. And then, and then once I started to practice these qigong, these meditative things, I started to strengthen my energetic fields. When these darts would come into my energy, um, they wouldn't come and hit me like right on my skin. They would come and hit me maybe a couple inches outside or then a couple feet outside. And then they didn't come and hit me at all because my energetic field was um, stronger. So they didn't affect me. You know, so it was like a building process so that it, I could actually um, use my energy in that multidimensional world to actually cause a change in something. And that's what we have to do is we have to learn how to build and strengthen our own energy field. And one of the most important lessons that we have to learn with building our own energy field is we have to learn what our energy feels like. Right. That's the most important thing. We have to learn what our energy feels like because once we learn that, then we can sense what is not our energy. Now, for and for everybody, is that different or are there some common things? Um, personally, I don't know because I think everybody's different. Okay. Um, me personally, um, I feel it. Um, there's many sensations to energy. There is the sensation of like a magnetic field where you can actually feel the density of almost like this bubble. Then there's the uh, it's almost like a cold wind. So you can get this cold air moving around your body and inside your body. Then there's the sensation of heat, of tingling, of pulling. That's a very interesting sensation is the it's the pushing and pulling. So you start to feel all these different things with the energy and you start to learn what they are. Um, that's for me. I don't know if it's exactly the same for every other person. Fair enough. But, yeah, because I've always wondered about that too. Like when I get certain feelings about things, here's what I've experienced. And, and although it's negative, it has always proven to be true and so i have this saying like i wish somebody would prove me wrong when it comes to the bs in life right and i mm -hmm. say that because i feel it as soon as it, i'm in its presence and it doesn't matter uh, if i'm next to somebody or i'm on the phone texting it doesn't matter when i know that there's a, a disingenuous energy around me i guess so to speak I know it, and I've never been wrong about it. I just never have. And even though in that, that moment someone may say, well, you're wrong, or I don't know, or I think that you might be wrong, later on I always find out that I wasn't wrong, you know, and I feel like, okay, what am I not doing here? Am I, am I trying to differentiate what I call intuition or paranoia, or is it all just energy? I should really start listening to this. I mean, that should be a clue. I'm not saying be negative all the time, but at least if you're starting to pick up patterns, you got to start learning from that stuff, I think. But remember, what is our greatest, um, what is our greatest intuition on the earth? What is the greatest intuition that we have? It's survival. That's right. Yeah. All right. So we have survival built into us and let's go back thousands of years and, you know, you come in contact with another human 
you have to make sure that this human is not going to kill you and take your stuff. Right. Yeah. You know, sure. so you have this kind of intuition about this person. You can feel the energy of this person. They could be speaking very kindly to you, but it just doesn't feel right. You know, so sometimes you, you, we have these survival mechanisms of intuition where you can still pick up on these subtleties of people. Um, a lot of people have lost that ability. Um, I'll give an example. Um, and I think every person listening has gone through this, I hope. Um, but when you're a child, somebody asks you to steal something for them. Mm -hmm. for, ex for example, uh, when I was a kid, a uh, very young kid, we went into a convenience store and one of my friends says, you know, take that candy, right? <laughs> well, when that person said that to me, right when they said that to me, it felt like someone punched me in the stomach. I got sick. I felt like I was going to throw up because I knew that it was wrong. Right? Right. And so that emotion that I felt, that was a survival mechanism. I knew that it was wrong. There was something not right in that situation. And I believe that um, through uh, the food that we eat, through TV, video games, from having these false realities imposed on us at a very early age of life, you know, you have kids basically playing war games on the computer or video games. They've, they lose that feeling of uh, reality, basically. So if, if someone says to them, hey, go steal that, they'll just be like, okay, and they won't feel anything. We, so we have these kind of survival oh. intuitions that are put in place to kind of keep us in a, like a straight line or to keep us alive. Whereas now, um, I would think with our new environment and the new um, stimuli of artificial reality, which is obviously the internet and video games and movies, which is very different now than it was when, I, when we grew up, um, it may start to numb those senses even more and harder to get back. Yeah, I totally agree. I totally agree with you on that. Um, and what I want to do uh, after we come back here is talk about how this uh, relates to us in uh, maybe the out-of-body experience. What types of things that will come up, uh, maybe even in the dream state, that will show us how we can better work with these things and learn our own energetic natures. And there's nobody better to talk to about this then the one and only Jason Quit, who's with us tonight. The Crystal Sun is the website. Also, tomorrow night on the program, Alex Sakaris is going to come back on the program and join us again from Skeptico. He'll be here tomorrow night. We'll be right back with Jason Quit. is young so turn up the heat with your host joe root on lighting the void on the fringe fm this is crow triple seven and you are listening to the fringe fm Do you want to know the truth? Are UFOs real? Are aliens visiting Earth? Are governments around the world hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO Seekers, official partner of The Fringe FM, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Join us as we investigate locations like Area 51 by subscribing on YouTube at youtube.com slash UFO Seekers. I'm Ryan Gable, and I want to remind you to keep your radio, phone, tablet, or computer tuned to The Fringe FM. And visit the website, thefringe.fm, to listen to the entire lineup of shows. You can also catch my broadcast, The Secret Teachings, Monday through Friday, beginning at 12 a.m. midnight U.S. Pacific Time, right here on The Fringe FM. Alex. Hi, I'm Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. OMG, people are jumping on board to the Life Change Tea Regiment. Brew, steep, and drink. 
for a gentle, taste great cleanse. It's changing how they feel. See what everybody's talking about. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea aids in digestive slowdown and helps people get moving down a healthy path. We won't make claims. We'll just let you decide. Experience is much better than a commercial anyway. If you want results, log on to GetTheTea.com and purchase your Super Strength Cleansing Tea. You won't be disappointed. And if you're looking for some mind-body suggestions, go to YouTube and punch in the search bar, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. Put power into your health now. So, GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com for Super Strength Tea. And YouTube, Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now for valuable suggestions. GetTheTea.com. The tea that makes you go. This is Reverend John M. Polk. Please visit me at johnpolkmedia.com and visit my show, Quantum Hologram Matrix, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, every Tuesday on thefringe.fm. Hey, Fringe FM listeners, did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or no Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of the Fringe FM by calling 701-719-3971. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. Saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Call 701-719-3971. That's 701-719-3971. Listen to the Fringe FM on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Hey, is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. Hola, French listeners. This is Dave Cruz of Beyond the Strange, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Canada. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. All right. Now we're getting just a level of deep here I'd like to get with uh, Jason Quitt from TheCrystalSun.com, also uh, author of Forbidden Knowledge and uh, the, uh, the Egyptian postures what you got the moon and the sun books i got both of those and the only book i don't have jason is the yosef codes and i can't wait to get into that too but i'm still learning a lot from you even though i don't have that book and uh what i wanted to discuss with you now is um see i've always had this feeling that uh that there were things that mess with us on an energetic level too that that don't necessarily come from us um and, and i don't know because i see it happen so often and uh i've always had this thought jason like it, when you're in turmoil or you don't understand something before you let your monkey mind go nuts on you just say look i've got two choices here in this situation right i can choose a love compassion or i can choose fear how i'm going to react and what i'm going to say is going to be based on both of these things uh and then as I started to learn about this so-called battle, more and more things started to fester up, right? I mean, I was really getting toyed with here. And this was a while back. And, and it seems like every uh, every boundary or barrier that I cross, I feel like I've accomplished something or mastered that. And then an even bigger, crazier demon, it feels like, is here to mess with that part of myself. Am I making any sense? Like through other people. Like I could meet Sally and Sally's so nice to everybody, 
But when Sally gets to me, all of a sudden Sally knows what to say to me. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> there's these demons in this realm of the mind that like to play tricks on people for sure. Yeah, and you're seeing it. And the more you become aware of it, the more it's going to happen until you start to heal yourself because you're starting to amplify um, not only the wounds that you carry, but you become a mirror again to uh, other people's projections. So the greater the light that you become and the more that you heal, uh, the more that these things are going to try to attack us. And I don't want to put any fear in anybody because you get to a certain place after that where it doesn't happen anymore so it does stop it really does when? but <laughs> i guess when? when when you've got into that place where um you're comfortable and you know yourself and you know your energy you don't react and anymore right exactly exactly and it's, it has to do with this whole reaction thing and we can talk about the out-of-body experience with entities for example, uh, it's the same thing where um, you wake up in the night and there's an entity there and you could literally see this thing and suddenly you get filled with the most intense fear. Yes. And and as you get more fearful, this thing almost takes a hold of you stronger. And then you realize for a second that when you're in that shock and in that fear, this thing is actually being pulled closer to you, you know? So when it happens a lot and you start to get comfortable with the situation, even though I, I would, you know, comfort is not the greatest word to use. Um, when you become used to the situation of an entity trying to mess with you, um, instead of going into the fear, you go into this place of peace or love or compassion, suddenly this entity is just gone immediately because it's like, okay, I can't get anything from this person. I'm just going to leave. And it's the same thing with people. So you get into situations with friends and family and they know exactly what to say to push your buttons um, just so you can have that reaction and feed this entity. So it's not going to go away. It's not going to go away until you yourself take responsibility and heal that thing within you. And once you do that, that will stop. And you do that by, I think you do that by setting up boundaries. Don't you like making it clear that about your own energy, like this is the amount of energy I'm willing to give in this situation. And then after that, I'm, I'm done because you can't. Yeah, you but will the, get sick for sure. Like I've been puking sick from stress and trying to figure out, well, why is this happening or what's this going on? Or am I messed up? Is it, you know, that stuff is, that's a bad rabbit hole to go down. It is, but you can't tell the other person this. That's, really? that's also, that's also a mistake. That's a trick. Because, huh? it, <laughs> There's another because it's, because it's subconscious in them, uh, you know? Gotcha. So if you say to them, you know, you're not really reacting. It's an entity reacting through you to get to me. That'll piss them off even more. Damn it. Because I have said that quite a bit. <laughs> okay, don't, do not say that. Because <laughs> um, like when I see it, I'm like, you, you got to understand that these things play in your little subconscious programs. They play and they're playing through you to get to me and they're playing through me to get to you. And around and around we go. Uh, have have yeah. the con have the conversation directly to that entity in your through your mind uh -huh. don't don't verbalize it to the person that's causing you this issue you know so it's like let's say somebody is uh, trying to pull energy or start something with me um you could just use the practice where you can sit there take in whatever the person is saying to you don't react. Don't be judgmental to them. And in the mind, say, you know, I know where this is coming from. I know that this is coming from this trauma, this pain, and this is why they're reacting in this certain way. But I do not, um, I do not allow my energy to be given to this trauma. You know, and you can just put up that mental block saying, you know, you can fight with me all you want. 
I'm not allowing you to steal or take my energy anymore. And have that conversation in your mind. Because you have to know that the reason this person is doing this to you is because this person is hurt as well. And if you knew the pain and suffering of the person that's inflicting this on you, the only thing you can see in them is love and compassion. Because you know that they're hurt. And that whatever they're saying to you, it doesn't even matter because it's coming from that place of hurt inside of them. It may be coming out in ways that are trying to trigger you, but you have to have that kind of other type of perception where you're observing the situation with the knowledge that this is what's occurring at this higher level and that you're not going to allow that to happen because, you know, we, um, I would say uh, we're born with two types of energy systems. We're born with the energy system, which comes from our accumulation of, let's say, past lives. So we come in with our energy fields and memories, but then we also come in with, and we borrow energy from our parents. So when we're born, we take the energy fields of our mother and our father, and that helps us grow in this world. So we actually have our the uh, we actually have our parents energy within us so if they're upset or if they're reacting to something even if they're from the other side of the planet it's still going to affect you you know what i'm saying wow that's so weird you say that because yeah like uh, is that why we can predict when bad things are going to happen to our loved ones it's like I, i've seen this before it's like we inherently know like when my dad got in a car wrecked, I knew he was stressed out and he was, his behavior wasn't right. And I hadn't talked to him in forever. And I knew something bad was going to happen from it. Almost as if, uh, he was too distracted to to focus and pay attention. And still I haven't communicated anything with him. And he's in a wreck the next day that I end up having to take care of him for a little while, you know? See, and this, this gets into another conversation. I don't know how deep you want to go. Man, Especially I'm, on the radio, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this stuff is important. I think because it's. Uh... I just don't want people to get afraid of what I'm about to say, but I'll just put this out there: that um, everything has a cost. Okay, I'll put it simply in those terms: everything has a cost. It's like a cause and effect. Okay, and. We may not understand it with the the human mind um, because we live in a multidimensional world. So let's say, for example, we're taking uh, food from the planet, right? We're taking uh, plants. We're taking animals to feed us. We're taking land to build build things. We're taking things, right, from this earth. And we're paying money, you know, as, okay, we're going to give money to receive this stuff, but there's an energetic cost to all these things. And the spirit world, the elemental world, the multidimensional world that we are built upon, um, they require um, sometimes a balance to take place. So there's a cost, an energetic cost to us taking from this planet. I think uh, <clears throat> I think you're talking about real karma here. Yes. And many people that are psychic um, and what you're discussing about feeling something bad is going to happen. This is the it's almost like these energies are warning you. They're saying to you, you've taken so much or your family has taken so much uh, that energetic debt has to be repaid in some way. And uh, sometimes that energetic debt is paid um, with a sickness or an accident or a trauma or something happens where there's a big energy release. And then um, the debt is paid. And from a human perspective, from not being taught this kind of cause and effect of spiritual energies, um, you know, we think bad things happen and we have no explanation for them. You know, why did this happen? So a lot of times 
um, especially uh, the natives, when they start to sense that buildup of energy of the land and they feel like, okay, something is going wrong or something is about to happen, what they do is they do a ceremony when they're, where they're giving offerings to the spirits, like either they're pouring alcohol or giving sage or tobacco to the fire, and they're giving offerings to the spirit to level out that balance, to clear that buildup so that that thing will not come to pass that they're feeling. Yeah, that is a pretty trippy thought. So in order, so how do we, I'll give you a really, I'll give you a really good example. And this also goes back to a uh, native tradition. Um, basically, um, and this is also the way I was taught. I wish I, I need to do it more, <laughs> obviously, uh, but they would carry a bag of tobacco around with them, for example. And tobacco, uh, the original meaning of tobacco is blessing. To give, a, to give tobacco is to bless. That's basically the, the cleanest translation of it. So, for example, if they were going to go into the woods and they needed, um, let's say, some cedar wood to make a tea or a sacred bath, if they're going to cut that branch off that tree, they'll say a prayer, ask the tree to, you know, give that branch to them. And to make it fair, they'll go into their pouch and they'll take a, some tobacco and they'll give it to the tree. And then there's this kind of like equal trade so that everything's in balance and alignment. Uh-huh. So I've seen that work with, like, in magic, uh, where they give, you know, when they ask something from a spirit, so to speak, that they give it uh, some type of acknowledgement, whether it's artwork, tobacco, or a blessing or something, you know. And, uh, you know, that's been uh, misconstrued in a lot of ways as making deals with devils and stuff, but... Not saying that's not true either, but I've seen that work, what you're talking about in the Western sense. Yes. And it just goes to the, th it just goes like this. If you're asking a spirit for something, it's going to want something in return, like this kind of equal exchange idea, right? So if you're, let's say, doing magic um, uh, from whatever teaching you're doing, and you're just constantly asking like spirits to do things for you or asking for help from the spirit world for all these things, but you're not giving anything back to them. It's like this debt will start to build up and something bad might happen. So this is, this is why um, there has to be some type of spiritual understanding and knowledge that there has to be balance. A debt always has to be paid. Um, and that's why we use, let's say, the tobacco or the sage or um, candy even. You know, the, many different cultures have different things. Like I remember when we uh, – there's a place called Manitoulin Island, which is about eight hours north of me. It's a completely native land. And they say that it's very dangerous to walk – in those forests it's extremely dangerous because they say the elementals are so powerful there that they will play tricks on you and you may be lost forever and i take those warnings extremely seriously <laughs> so you know what they say you have to do is before you go into that forest you have to take candy and place it down as an offering to those elementals and basically ask them permission to walk on their land and not to mess with you. You know, here you go. Please invite me on your land. This is a gift. And please watch over me as I walk through your sacred land. You know? Yeah. So there, there is this kind of mutual respect and responsibility that we have with the spiritual world. And when we disconnect from that and abuse it, bad stuff is going to happen. So, I mean, how how could it not? Right, right. So this is interesting because I've brought this up on the show before how Israel Rigardi, who is uh, one of my favorite authors and magicians, talks about how the astral realm uh, and the psychic world is not really a place for play. 
and should be used wisely for spiritual development uh, and energetic development. I don't know if I've asked you, but would you agree with that? Completely. And, you know, I get the question asked all the time is, you know, how do I leave my body? How do I get out? How do I call in these beings? And my answer is, why the hell would you want that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it, like people want beings to take over their body. If people want to be abducted, people want some type of contact experience. People want to leave their body and travel because it sounds really great on paper. But it's very difficult, that world. And there's many things in there that uh, are potentially dangerous to you. And if you don't know how to handle yourself, um, it could be dangerous to go into those worlds. You will bring you, you will bring something back with you, <laughs> you know. So we have to tread lightly and we need good teachers and understanding of the spirit world. And we can't go in there like a child thinking like this is the coolest thing in the world. I'm enlightened. Um, there are boundaries, there are rules, and if you don't respect it, you'd probably get a cosmic slap, and you may not feel so good the next day. Right. Yeah, Vince, I've I've had a few cosmic slaps myself. Um, I think we all have. But um, so when you when you go out of body and you meet an entity, right? What do you do? Because uh, in magic, they talk about they would hold up certain signs or make certain suggestions. And if the entity couldn't do it back, then they weren't trustworthy. Is there something that you do like that or to figure no. out what you're dealing no. with? No, no. For me, it's like um, it's just instinct. And you develop this over um, a long period of time because they can appear – as things they think you want to see. Uh All right. So they could appear to you as an angel. They could appear to you as a close family member. So when you come in contact with these beings, they may look like the thing that you're seeking, right? Because they know what you're seeking. So they could take a form. So I've had many instances where a being will be in front of me. They could be taking the form of a family member. They could be taking the form of, let's say, a higher master. And as they're speaking to me, I get a sense that there's something not right in this situation. Huh? And, and it happens really fast. Like in the astral world, things happen very, very fast. So it's like within the first word that they start talking to you, there's something going off in your mind saying, no, there's something not right here. And then what I would do is I would pretty much demand to see its true form and nature. And um, there was, you know, you can do this through telepathy, telepathy or through will. And you could change their form and you can see what they really are. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and and then there is the, and I've done this before and it was very crazy because um, I don't know how I knew this, but it was just instinct. It's almost like I've done this before in other lives. But basically, um, there was one time I was out of my body and my mother was there and she was talking to me about something and it just didn't make any sense to me. It didn't feel right. And I created this uh, star tetrahedron like a a laser star tetrahedron in between my hands coming out of my heart in the astral world. And I blew it up and I put it around the being, which was taking the form of my mother. And once I did that, it instantly lost its form. And I saw that it was this entity, this dark entity. And I just started to spin that star tetrahedron and I shot it up into outer space, basically, you know, goodbye kind of thing. Um, so you have to really, um, not really jump to, um, what you see in the astral world. I think that's the best warning I could say is that, um, if a being that comes up to you that looks dark, um, sometimes it's not. Sometimes a being comes to you, they look like they're a being of light. 
Sometimes they're not. So you have to treat every single being or entity that comes to you from a state of neutrality. You know, so you're just staying in your peace. You're not jumping to any conclusions. And if something doesn't feel right, then you can handle it and deal with it. Um, there are times where I'm sleeping at night where an entity will come into the room and try to um, hurt me or, you know, manipulate or do something that's not what, right to me. What do you mean hurt you? Like physically hurt you? Like try to pull me out of my body or try to push themselves into my body or it feels like, let's say, they're suffocating me or, or something. Um, and sometimes you will just turn in the astral and basically fight them. And that's kind of like a, um, maybe like a survival response. Yeah. Um, it doesn't really help though. Does it, does it help to physically uh, fight? Usually them? when so you usually good. fight them, not really. Cause sometimes, um, <laughs> Like I, I, there was an entity once that was, and this goes back to the whole mind thing. Um, it was basically uh, placing dreams in me and I knew they weren't my dreams. So then when I would pop out of the astral, I would see this being basically projecting the dreams inside of me. And when I tried to fight it, this thing, um, it literally looked like, uh, what someone would draw as a demon from the Bible. Wow. Like really, it looked like uh, like dark red uh, dragon like with a goat's head, like really weird thing, you know. And I tried to fight it, but it its claws it had long nails, and it it, it hurt fighting this thing because it would scratch you. Um, and then I, I I knew I couldn't fight it, and I just went back into my peace and I said a mantra, like a sacred mantra that I say all the time, which is Ra Ha. And when I started to say that mantra, this thing just got the hell out of there very fast. Yeah, because you so, were shifting the you were shifting the environment and it was about to die, I bet. You know, its whole thing couldn't survive in that environment. That's interesting. At least that's what I think. Because you know, another thing that I wonder about and shoot, we gotta take a break here, but I you know, dreams have an immense influence on people, especially if they don't recall the dream. And so I know uh, that you can plant things subconsciously into people uh, through dreams. And it does make me wonder, like, I don't want to talk about all the scary stuff, but I think we, we should be aware of what is causing us to think certain things, especially when it comes to fear and harm and stuff. Like, maybe I'll set it up this way, Jason. Can... um can entities be messing with your dreams to get you to react a certain way? Um, the answer is a hundred percent yes. And you know, you, you know, you're we're giving warnings like this shouldn't be scary. And I would just say that this is just a part of the growth to create a strong mind and energy, right? Because once we start to become aware of it and understand the players, these players lose their power and you gain the power. So you come out of it with a lot of strength and maybe it's good to talk about it because it's, you know, it's also coming close to Halloween. So this is the perfect time to talk about these. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. And right now we're going to go to Vance with the news and we'll be right back with Jason quit. And we can talk about some scary stuff, things implanting nasty dreams and programs into your mind so you can think and feel a certain way to get you to react in a way that's not best for you doesn't that make you feel like you're out of control it does to me unless you say like jason once you learn about it then you can really become a powerful person we'll be right back with jason quick
your mind? It's Lighting the Void with your host, Joe Roop. Hello, this is Vance Nesbitt. Take the time to expand your mind by listening to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop right here on the Fringe FM. From the news center outside the city of Chicago in the great Midwest, it's the Stranger Than Fiction News right here on the Fringe FM. I'm Vance Nesbitt. Here's our headlines. For a fourth time, a Montana hunter has been attacked by a grizzly bear in the last 10 days. A fourth hunter in Montana has been injured by a grizzly bear in the last 10 days, marking the most recent attack of its kind in the Big Sky Country. The fourth victim was injured in the Gravely Mountains in the same stretch of wilderness just eight miles south of where three hunters were hurt in two separate encounters back on September 16th. According to the news outlet, the Ohio man was mauled on September 24th near Coal Creek Drainage and Eureka Basin Road, telling officials that he was ambushed by a bear while walking through a blown-down timber area. According to a statement by Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, said during the incident, the man reportedly fired multiple shots at the bear until it left. The man was able to meet up with members of his hunting party and get medical attention. It was unclear if the same bear was responsible for all the September attacks. Source, foxnews.com And scientists now believe some black holes could be portals to other galaxies. New simulation models are suggesting that a rotating black hole may offer safe passage to another part of the galaxy or a different galaxy altogether. Though it's been a reoccurring theme in science fiction for decades, a black hole itself has never been considered a feasible form of space travel because scientists have always believed that the mysterious tidal forces inside the event horizon would spaghettify and crush anything that dared to enter it. But scientists now say a new simulation models are suggesting that a rotating black hole which contains a unique mass inflation singularity may actually offer safe passage to another part of the galaxy or a different galaxy altogether. The team of physicists from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and Georgia Gwinnett College say their simulations show the singularity at the center of a large rotating black hole could actually facilitate a quote-unquote gentle passage through rips in space-time. And for more details on this story, go to themindunleashed.com. And it's time for another stranger-than-fiction fringe fun fact of useless proportion. Terranophobia is the fear of being tickled by feathers. It's also the fear of feathers themselves. The word taro is the Greek word for feather, and phobia is also a Greek word meaning fear. This has been the Stranger Than Fiction News on the Fringe FM. Again, I'm Vance Nesbitt, news anchor and sorcerer. This is Sammy. Join us in the Deep South as we're lighting the void with Joe Roop on the Fringe FM. Right, me old chiners. I know it's an ad break, but before you lot shoot off and make yourself a cup of Rosie Lee or whatever else it is you're going to sling down your Gregory Peck, you need to listen to me bubble. If, like me, you found your way to light in the void via a downloadable podcast, you might want to take a butcher's at the Fringe FM Wind and Kite. You won't Adam and Eve how many other shows there are or what they rabbit on about. Ancient history, conspiracy, the consciousness, the esoteric, the occult, metaphysics, parapolitical, ufology, technology and spirituality to name but a few. They got featured hosts like Ryan Gable, Jeremy Scott, Alex Exum, Tim Doyle, Cortana and Gigi, Susanna Ross, the Reverend John Polk, Michael Deacon and J.D. Lewis. You might find yourself listening to the thoughts and theories of the author of The Fish You Just Finished Reading. Or you could pick up The Dog and Bone, 
call in and tell everyone your own beliefs or experiences. So do me a favour. Before you put on the Ansel or crack open a bottle of vino or roller joint, go to the Fringe FM and see what you're missing. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. So call Joe, pick up the phone, dial 1-800-588-0335, toll free from the United States or Canada. All right, let's get into this, the Halloween scary truth of uh, these entities and how they can implant things in your mind and mess with your life. And, and and I wanted the reason why I'm talking about this too, Jason, is kind of wrap it back full circle before we get into this. Is that a, a lot of things start in your mind um, to cause certain emotions. I mean, you could tailspin totally. Uh, and I'll give you guys an example, a real example of what happened to me after Jason explains this. But I believe you could totally tailspin emotionally, mind, everything, if you let these things control you. Um, and I've witnessed it firsthand, but, uh, I'll let you speak on that because you know quite a bit more about it than me, how these things can actually really get dark with you. Yeah. And, um, it all started, um, when I was doing my shamanic training and I was going to different classes and there was one teacher I know whose name is uh, Dennis Burnett, um, out here in Canada and very, very gifted psychic, um, very gifted psychic. And one day uh, he took me aside and he just said these words to me. He said, what if I told you your thoughts are not yours? And that kind of just blew my mind. And I, I didn't understand it at first. You know, I'm just learning these things. This is back in the day. And it really stuck with me. And he said to me, he goes, you know, when you're like walking down the street and just a thought comes in your mind and it's just totally out of character of you. And you're like, well, why did I think that? Yeah. He said, he said, well, those aren't your thoughts and you don't have to accept them as yours. So when it happens, just say this mantra, you are not my thoughts. Please leave now. So what he said to me. And then he also said, he said, you know, when you're at, you know, you're in bed at nighttime And your mind just is like going crazy. Like you can't go to sleep. Your mind is just going nuts uh, with scenarios and ideas and all these things. He says that's the the time when um, these things could place their thoughts in you the easiest. And just say, you are not my thoughts. Please leave now. So that became my mantra. And with my meditation practice, with my Qigong, um, I would add that mantra, you are not my thoughts. And I would do it when I would walk down the street and I'd get a thought. I would just say, you're not my thoughts, please leave now. So I didn't even like accept it as my thoughts or my reality. Now, this really came to a head, I would say months after uh, this uh, information came to me. I was sleeping at night and I'm in a normal dream. And then in the dream, I hear my own voice. It's my own voice speaking to me. And it said to me, Jason, I have to tell you, um, you're dying of cancer. And you only have a couple more months left on this planet. Um, and that was the message I got in the dream. Oh, my God. And, and, and right away, what happens? Right away in my dream state, I start getting very sad. And I'm thinking to myself, Oh my God, I'm dying. Um, how do I, you know, tell my friends, how do I tell my family? What do I do in this situation? Because I'm, I'm not going to be here for so much longer. (laughs) And then something just took over my mind, which was the mantra. And I just said, wait a second, my thoughts aren't mine. And when I came to that awareness I suddenly popped out of my body and had an out of body experience. Whoa. And there was a being laying with me in my bed. Whoa, wait a Speak. minute. Hold hold the phone here. Like yeah. when you say laying with you, 
like you just turned your head and it said hi jason <laughs> like that that kind no. of playing with you or what no no i i popped out of my body so i uh, sat up in bed <clears throat> and i could see this thing laying in the bed behind me and it was talking in the back of my head what in the hell okay See, I've always known this was real, but I've never heard this story. First time I ever heard this one. What did you do after that? And then what I did was, well, first of all, I was extremely angry, obviously. <laughs> you know, some people are saying, you know, you have to be very uh, spiritual and, and in peace to leave your body. Right. Hell no. I was livid mad <laughs> out of my yeah. body. I was pissed out of my body. <laughs> and I literally grabbed this thing by the arm and I pulled it up to me. That's how angry I was. And it started freaking out. Like it was trying to get away from me, but I wouldn't let go of it because obviously it wasn't expecting me to wake up in that manner. <laughs> you know. And I demanded, I said, who are you? What are you doing here? And it was speaking to me telepathically but it was all gibberish. It was like garbled nonsense. I couldn't make any sense of what it was saying. And then I just said, are you a being of the light? Because I heard that's what you're supposed to ask these things. And it, it actually worked. This being just calmed right down. And it just clearly said, no, I am not. And when it said that to me, I just said, you know, I'm not going to use the actual words I said, but basically I said, get out of here and never come back and bother me again. You're not al ever allowed to manipulate me ever again. And it left. Mm. Now, there's there's a couple levels of craziness to this story. The first level of craziness is what if I were to believe I was dying? Oh, my God. Yeah. Was this being implanting something that could actually manifest if I were to believe it and give it energy and power? That's one. Two, this being didn't look like a shadow or a demon or anything like that. This being was beautiful. It looked like a sparkling like an bright angel. white light. Yeah, yeah, it looked like an angel. And... That's when I, that was like, that was my cosmic slap in the face. <laughs> like that's when it was like everything changed for me where I knew that these things could place dreams, thoughts, ideas within us. And if they seed those ideas and thoughts within us, then they become an entity attachment and start to feed and create that reality for you. Now, I'm going to make a confession here that, you know, I would like to play stupid at this point, but I just can't. I've actually battled these bastards myself, Jason, but not with me, but with loved ones. And, uh, I don't, maybe I don't see my own, but I see others being attacked. Does that ever happen to you where you can see these things yes. attacking people that you care about? Yes. And you and, don't want to tell them because if you tell them, you know, they're going to freak out to no, ex I mean, you can't, you know. Well, you know what? Um, I'll just say that there was or there still is a very close uh, family member of mine. And they started to be attacked at night. Basically, the beings would come into the room and basically t like try to convince them to kill themselves, that right. it was like the only option in life. And he would literally fight these things, like literally fight these things and have out of body experiences and see them. And he was like going crazy. Um, you know, it was really, really affecting his life, obviously. Right. <laughs> Nobody wants to go through that. And luckily, I went through that process before him. So I was able to um, talk him through what's going on and what he has to do. And he eventually came out of it very quickly. While but he was asleep, of, you talked him through it? or No, like um, 
because he knew I was going through things as well. So he uh, became, well, he opened up to me that this was happening to him. And I helped guide him through it. Like uh, we would meet up and go for walks and, and talk about what was going on. But this is happening to real people all around the world. And they have no idea what's going on to them. They think they're crazy. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, they're giving in to these beings. Mm. And they feel powerless to these beings. Yeah. Yeah. Um Let's see. Let's take this phone call real quick. Oh, they hung up. Okay. Well, call back 619, whoever that was. Um, uh, uh-oh. I, yeah, they just called in. As soon as I pulled the fader up, it dropped. There they are. Uh, you, let's see. Now, I just want to make sure that, that you're on the line here. Is this uh, 619 area code? You're on the air with Jason Quit. Who are we speaking with? Hello. Well, I guess they're not there. Um, anyways, so I've had my own experience with this too, cause I've seen this, I've heard these things, I've heard them speak through people and I've seen them with my own eyes too as well. And I feel like that, I don't know. I feel like that I, I can't fight them. So instead of fighting them, I'm going to combat them with other things. Like I'm going to try to tell this person while they're asleep about love and about, uh, the good things and maybe it'll balance itself out because in my experience when i've tried to fight these things it's turned into chaos for me yeah and i'm just too afraid to fight them so when they go away i try to implant better thoughts in that person's mind so to speak um i think are you there 619 area code yeah i got cut off once but i'm here all right and uh what's on your mind do you have a question for jason quit yeah, well, no, I was just, um, his story reminded me of a story that happened to me, and I was going to share it. Sure, with, go ahead. Um, my son had um, one of those cameras on his computer, and it went on and went off by itself. Nobody was by the computer and laying on the bed, and it, it took a photograph of this, like, skeleton on the bed, and it looked like it had a... Um, like an Egyptian hat, one of those long hats on there. Oh, hell. It's, it's one of the things I've been trying to find because we took copies of it. And one of these days I'm going to share it on Discord. It's really freaky. Yeah, wow. that would be great if you did share that. If you, I mean, we would be yeah. thankful to to see that. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that, Jason? My thoughts are there are things that cameras can pick up. And the interesting thing about your story is that the camera went on by itself and took the picture, which tells me that this type of intelligence wanted you to see um, its form. And basically, it set it up for you. For what purpose? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Just a mess so with you, maybe. Very freaky. That um, is very freaky. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Uh, um, who are we speaking with? I didn't even ask you what uh, your name was. Sorry. This is Angel. Hey, Angel. Yeah, that's a pretty uh, freaky thing to happen. Uh, uh, what would you yep. suggest that she does for protection? Is there anything that she can do to make sure that don't happen again? Um, what well, I would was, do... It, it was a long uh, time ago. It was a long time ago. All right. Well, how about for my own sanity then? In case I see something um, like that. Um, what I would do is I would just kind of... Uh, the easiest thing to do is smudge the room after so just bring in the prayers, um, burn cedar wood or sage um, or an incense in the room, burn it, give the prayers to clear the space. Or you could even take a, a singing bowl or a, a bell and hit those frequencies in the room and ask for the, the room to be cleared and the portals to be closed. Um, and that should work. But nothing is permanent for yeah. anything. So you may have to do it every, maybe once a month or once a year type of thing. Thank you, uh, Angel, for sharing that with us. That was a really, uh, really interesting phone call, really interesting experience. Thanks for calling in. Uh, anybody yeah. else is welcome to call in if they want to. Now, so what I was saying is, is I tried to combat these things, but it didn't work. It seemed like the more 
I tried to combat them. Um, the more they, the worse it got. And then I was like, okay, I've, I've made this into something that it never, I, I you know what I started thinking? I started thinking this is this own person's fight, not mine. Cause I'm making it worse. I felt yeah. like I was making it worse by trying to help, you know, it, it is the person's responsibility. It is not yours. And I'll put a positive spin on this is that, um, these things that connect to us or the wounds that we carry, I'll call them placeholders. All right. So they're holding you in the place of experience that you need to be at at this moment in your life. And when you're willing and ready to take that next step on your journey, the healing process will already begin. And these things will leave you um, by making that decision to take that step. All right, so they're they're just temporary and they're just placeholders to hold you in a certain experience for this moment in your life. And that's the way that I view them. I, I don't, don't see them as neg I, I honestly I don't see it as negative anymore. It's a strange thing to say, but I don't see any of these things as being negative. I see them as um some type of teaching. Um, and once you learn how to step out of it, you gain something huge from those experiences. Well, I had this listener uh, that was a good friend of mine a long time ago. Not well, not too long ago. The show's not that old. But uh, they practiced Reiki, right? And um, I feel like I could tell the story to you now. They practiced Reiki and... Uh, I don't know what kind of protection they were using, but one day they just started uh, talking just, just crazy stuff. They were saying that um, they could hear my voice talking to him in their head, telling them that this was all a game. They ended up in the hospital, and their mm-hmm. their children ended up calling me because they knew that this person listened to this radio show, right? And mm-hmm. they thought that I had put some kind of curse on this person, and I cared about this person a lot. And I'd not ever done that or even thought about doing that. Um, it never entered my mind, but something in their mind was telling them that they could hear my voice and that my voice was telling them things. And it bothered the hell out of me for months and even to this day when I think about it. But, I mean, what are we up against here, man? I mean, you're saying that these are good things, but sometimes I wonder just, I don't know. I'm I'm saying everything is perspective. And when I was going through it, obviously, I didn't think it was good. I thought it was the worst possible thing happening to me. It was scary. I was upset and angry and I didn't couldn't understand why it was happening to me. And that's that's will make you crazy in itself is why is this happening to me? But it all comes back to the strength and will of our energy. It literally, it just comes back to that. And these things can manipulate or connect with us because we're open energy systems. It's just the way we're made. We live in a multidimensional spiritual world. So we have this kind of openness and connection to other beings and other worlds right here on earth. Um, Unfortunately, we're not taught that and it's very taboo and you're crazy if you believe it. (laughs) right? But this is what I believe. This is my reality that I see. So once we start to first know that it's real and know that these things can happen to people, then we can have a better solution and have more support and understand how to navigate through it. Because just from that simple thing that I said before, you are not my thoughts, please leave now. You know, if your friend was hearing those voices, he could have sat down and meditated. And I know it sounds hard to do when you're in that situation, but that's where the will comes in. You have to be grounded and, and know that this is coming from an outside source. These things can mimic other people's voices, other people's images Um, to get a point across. So we have to take that step. And the problem is, is that it's the healers. 
um, many healers, they don't understand that they are the filter. What do you All mean right? by this, that? They are the filter, as in when they are doing healing energy on somebody, it doesn't matter what prayers you say or what protection you put up, you are going to take that person's energy through your energy field. So you're going to become a filter of their energy and your energy and the environmental energy around you. So as a healer, it's extremely easy to pick up on other people's energies. Um, and this is why many healers become very sick. So you have to really um, have a very strong energy field. You have to really have your channels, meridians uh, flowing because these are the, the filters that will pass the other person's energy through your body. If the healer has blocks um, or if their energy is sluggish in certain areas of their body, when they're doing or removing toxic energies or even entities from another person, those energies or entities will connect to the healer's weakest spots. Oh, no. Okay. And that, that like I'm I'm saying this because this is very important for healers to understand and know and don't go into your ego and say, no, my healing system is better and I'm protected. And, you know, I just cover myself in white light. That's all fine and dandy. But you're still moving energy through your energy field because you are an open energy system. And that's just the way the universe works. So. If you are carrying things that are blockages within you, that is where um, the energies of other people will get stuck the most. So as a healer, you have to take very good care of yourself energetically, physically, mentally, and understand that you need to be in a very good position energetically to start taking on and moving and, and working with other people's energies. And we're talking about a healer. Anybody can pray for anybody. Anybody could send well wishes. That's completely fine. But once you start to manipulate energy with their permission, obviously, uh, for, he for healing purposes, that's when you have to um, be very careful on what you take on. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good, uh, good information there for anybody that likes to do healing work. Um, and if you're calling in, try not to put it on speakerphone because it feeds back and it's hard to handle on the show. It looks like we got a 618 area code. You're on the air with Jason Quit, who he's speaking with. Hey, Pat, hey, what's Pat. on your mind? Hey, I was just wondering. Jason's got a lot of knowledge in his head. Has he ever thought about doing a YouTube channel or starting a show or something? Great question. I am actually this month, I can't believe you asked this, this month I'm actually setting up a little studio so I could actually have my own YouTube show. The thing is, um, I don't like the way I sound. I don't <laughs> like the way I look on camera. And I'm a perfectionist. So <laughs> all those things together make me very nervous. Um, so what I do want to do on the show is yes, bring knowledge, but I also want to kind of bring it in a humorous, entertaining way, um, to not scare people like I'm doing on Joe's show. Oh yeah. You're real scary. <laughs> right, right. But, but you know, nobody likes the way they sound. That's why I stay hidden. Or I try to, cause I'm way cooler online than in real life, you know? So Great. I think, I think we all Jason's are. got a good calming voice though. Yeah, you do. Thank you. I will. I am. I, I don't say I will. I am going to do a YouTube show um, and hopefully it'll be ready in November. So um, I don't know what it's called. Are you going to have things like Qigong on there and things that you do and kind of simplify things down for everybody? Oh, yes, yes. I'm going to try to do everything. And I've already spoken to a lot of people um, a lot of my friends uh, that do the conference circuit with me, a lot of radio hosts, um, and I'm inviting you, Joe, as well. When I do this show, I'm going to try to figure out how to bring you guys in on it. Oh, cool. Guys and girls. 
So we can talk about any, any topics and, um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Sounds cool. Good question. Is that all the questions you got, Pat? Hey, that's all I wanted to know, man. I appreciate you taking my phone call. Jason rocks. You rock. Can't wait to see him. Thanks. Thanks for your phone call. Thank you. Yeah, that would be cool for you to do, man. And bring in, you know what, bring in the, uh, comedy factor into such a serious field would be a good idea actually no doubt about it i mean it really would be and too damn serious aren't they yeah and when you go through the experience in life like i have you need a sense of humor or (laughs) else you're not getting very far plus i'm also canadian so it just comes naturally no we won't hold that against you you know, yeah. <laughs> you're you're one, you're one of the only one of the only few Canadians I really like. No, I'm just playing. We got a ton of Canadian listeners in the audience. It's just, uh, I think a lot of people are drawn to scary things. Um, and there's no other month to to talk about that than this month, right? And that's when all the stuff comes out. Uh, I do wonder why. Almost, I get, I think I get a little angry about it sometimes. Like, why are we so drawn to the dark stuff? And then wonder why we got all these problems. You know. Well, remember, everything in life is a cycle. Life and death is a cycle. The moment you're born, you're basically dying, right? Yep. And remember, um, see, I don't know what it's like down in Arkansas, but up in Canada here, we have the four seasons. And around October, around um, Halloween, literally, the trees are dying. They're going into hibernation for the winter. Everything's going into hibernation. So it's it's showing us the cycles of life and death that we're in like this death cycle now and they say the veil is thin the veil is very thin um around um the time of halloween because that's when everything is going into this uh death and hibernation mode it's just a natural cycle on the earth and i believe that this is where all the superstitions and all the old knowledge came from around this time Um, And this is, I guess, why they say that you could communicate with spirits better around Halloween. And that's why you honor them around Halloween, because it's just the time of year that it's the easiest to do. God, I love it. Actually, I really do. It's like it is the favorite time of year for me. Look, we only got a a few minutes left here with Jason. Um, I know I'm I'm already keeping him up late and uh I don't want to waste any of Jason's precious energetic time because we all of our, you know, and I say that very sarcastically, but I mean that all of our time, I think we need to realize an energy is more precious than, uh, than, uh, what we think it really is. And so we need to learn how to use it properly. And Jason quits here with us to uh, help us do that. We'll be right back. Listeners, this is Dave Cruz of Beyond the Strange, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. The truth is out there. There's something out here. And so are we. KTOK Digital Broadcasting, The Fringe FM. Introducing Shadow Light Tarot from Waking Canvas. The Fringe FM's new contributing artist, Eric Tisi. This hand-illustrated black-and-white self-published deck serves as a reinvention of the tarot never before witnessed. Each of the several suits of this 88-card deck lineup form an infinite panoramic scene. Even the included visual companion guidebook is entirely hand-illustrated, cover to cover with beautiful visuals and esoteric symbols and artwork. The newly released deck comes in a custom magnetic box 
box with its own travel pouch. The Shadow Light Tarot Premium Deck and its travel size mini deck, Wonder Light Tarot, are both available now from wakingcanvas.com. If you use the code word FRINGE, that's F-R-I-N-G-E at checkout, you'll receive an extra 10% off your entire order. To discover more, including a free reading and time lapses of all the illustrated artwork, make your way over to wakingcanvas.com today. That's wakingcanvas.com. Hey, this check is wrong. I worked a holiday and seven hours of overtime. Not getting paid correctly is a real pain. It could also hurt our boss if our company provides out-of-compliance checks. That's right. Construction companies doing business with the government can get fined, or officials of the companies can go to jail if the checks aren't right. It's a law. The Davis-Bacon Act has 30 compliance issues for every check, but there is an easy way for construction companies to be in compliance. EMARS offers Compliant Client, a web-based system that finds and corrects all 30 of the possible out-of-compliance check issues. Users of Compliant Client report an 80% savings in time and money. Running a weekly payroll usually takes about five minutes. All 15,000 plus clients of EMARS have never had a legal compliance issue. Plus, they sleep better on check day. Contact EMARS at emarsinc.com or call 480-595-0466. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Somewhere between abnormal and paranormal, there's a show called Into the Paranormal. I'm Jeremy Scott. Hear me live Saturdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern on the Fringe FM. We all have that story to tell in our lives. The winds were howling. The ground shook. You could hear rushing water. And then history repeats itself. When there's no power, refrigeration fails. Doors with their shelves strip bare. ATMs can't operate. Deliveries stop. Then what? These events can last days or weeks. You need a plan. In statements made during recent interviews, FEMA Administrator Brock Long has repeatedly urged all Americans to understand three truths. FEMA is broke. The system is broken. If this is the new normal, Americans can't rely on federal cavalry when disaster strikes. Don't get caught out in the elements empty-handed. Prepare with us by going to preparewiththefriends.com and get your two-week food supply, 92 servings, eight food varieties with 25-year shelf life, normally $137 now only $75. Or get a month's supply, normally $247, now only $147 shipped in one business day. Just go to preparewiththefriends.com or call 888-440-7931. That's 888-440-7931. Get this great offer and be prepared while it lasts. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Thanks for listening to this broadcast. Need another late night fix? You can tune in every weeknight to Lighting the Void with Joe Root on the Fringe FM. number is 1-800-588-0335. Jason Quinn is our guest tonight. You know, this is one of those uh, shows that I actually, uh, no offense, Jason, but I feel kind of relieved to do, man. Uh, if I know Jason Quinn is coming on my show, then I don't have to pressure myself into doing some deep-seated humming research because I've read your books 
I know quite a bit about you. It's, this is like maybe the third, possibly the fourth time. I think it's the third time you've been on the show. So it's a pleasure, man. And I say that with uh, the utmost respect, that it is an absolute pleasure to have you on the show because I learned something. I, I, I'll always consider you a mentor, even though we're the same age. I'll always consider you a mentor. You always teach me something when I'm on here, man. And I really appreciate your time. Don't I really do. Thank you. Thank you. And I love coming here. And I, I think it might actually be the fourth or fifth time I'm Is on. It? Okay. Yeah. I think you're so, probably yeah. right. The fourth or fifth time. Well, you know, we're not on the lower circuit yet. It's when you do the little river shows when you got to start worrying. So you're still good, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> you're on the fringe FM. You're fine. Um, now, here's the thing. I got this issue of Nexus Magazine from a guest that was just on, Stephen Schwartz, who's a publisher of Nexus Magazine, and he sent me a copy for free. I actually emailed it overnight, or emailed it, mailed it overnight. And he, there's a long article in here by Valerie Burke about how Shungite is the electro-pollution solution, the world's oldest and best-kept secret. Now, this is something that... You talked about in your postures to the moon and the sun, right? Both, uh, both books, correct? Mm-hmm. No, I did. I did. Um, we use the uh, shungite um, with the set of the healing rods for the polarity of the body. The electroconductive nature of the body will use that shungite to connect to the electromagnetic fields of the earth around us. And it will also pull the energy through the meridians and ground the body. So we use shungite in many different ways. And it's interesting that this article is talking about electromagnetic pollution because um, it has to do with the actual structure, the formation of the shungite, which is a, um, uh, I would call it a buckyball structure, a carbon C60, which is a very rare type of carbon. And, you know, what do we use carbon for? We use carbon to filter our water because it's porous, right? It, it, it captures metals and it captures um, impurities in the water. It holds it in that carbon and then it um, makes it actually um, quite harmless. Mm. Um, it also filters the air. So uh, carbon filter could take uh, toxins out of the air. <clears throat> I just have to drink some water. Hold on a second. And it's the same thing with energy. So this this sponge like carbon structure um, holds negative energy or toxic energy, and I've been using shungite for pff, at least at least plus ten years. Been using shungite, and I've noticed some very interesting things with shungite. I used to have, um, or I don't used to have. I still have these shungite pyramids and what we do is we put them in front of the computers and we put them in front of tvs any like real electronic devices that we're spending too much time with usually put a a shungite pyramid between you and that object and actually i'm i'm going to go pick up shungite pyramids and put them on my uh, website coming up uh, this week but what i noticed something very interesting that you shouldn't notice I had a Shungite pyramid in front of my TV um, for probably a couple of years. And when I went to go pick up this pyramid, it looked like the pyramid was expanding. And it was expanding so much from the inside out that the pyramid was actually breaking and cracking all around the Shungite pyramid. And I've heard someone tell me this before that these objects will suck the negative energy up and store it within the shungite. And eventually when it becomes uh, too much, the shungite will start to break down and then you just have to take it and put it in your garden and bury it into the earth. And I think I've been through about three shungite pyramids between me and the TV. And each time, you know, it's, it's it's a solid stone. It's not supposed to be doing this, but it's actually expanding and cracking. Wow. And it's a very strange thing to see. So they say that um, even wearing shungite, like wearing a shungite bracelet or putting shungite on your cell phone, it has some type of effect of um, 
taking the toxic energy to the shungite instead of it going through the body. Now, obviously, you're not covering your entire body in shungite because, you know, it, it's just a small area, but it has some type of an effect. And right now we live in a world that has um, a lot of electromagnetic pollution, a lot of toxic energies in our environment. So by adding these natural elements like shungite carbon C60, which is a very powerful carbon-based stone, it's like you're adding this energetic sponge so that the energy doesn't go to you where you absorb it. The shungite will absorb it for you. And um, I would say it does it for many years and look at it and, and check the shungite out, especially if it's a pyramid and, and visually see, is this expanding? Is it cracking? What is the shungite doing after many years? And then you know it's working. You know that it's taking on that energy for you. This is all about uh, EMF waves from what I'm seeing here. And the electromagnetic yes. spectrum and what shungite can actually protect you from. And, yeah, you're right, because the article talks about that the people wear, like, jewelry and uh, put it around their home and workplace. And even people drink shungite water or apply it to their water. Do you think that's effective as well? Um, I would be cautious yeah, about using shungite in water. And the reason I would be cautious, and I know that a lot of people swear by it, but I would be personally cautious because there's a high level of pyrite in shungite. And pyrite is an iron. And when you put iron in the water, it'll start to oxidize and turn to rust. So um, when you put just raw shungite in water, um, if you leave it in there for more than a week, it's definitely going to start rusting, um, which is not good for you. So just, just keep that in mind and be aware if your water starts to taste very bloody, <laughs> that's <laughs> because it's a very high iron content being oxidized and you don't want to drink that. You really don't. What if you got a bloodlust, you know? Well, I don't. I'm just I'm not a, It's a, Halloween. Come on. Now. It's Halloween. So well, uh, this is something that I've tried myself. I actually... I'm more into like a ceremonial ritual and meditation, but I did try uh, some of what you had in your book there. And I can tell you that um, there were some times that I felt, I felt out of balance in a good, not in a good way, but in a way that it shook me a little bit, almost like uh, I don't even know if I was ready to do the exercises yet, to be honest with you. I think my energy was so out of whack that when I started doing this stuff, I would get these feelings of imbalance, like something was shaking beneath my feet. Does that make any sense to you, or was that just? Uh, uh, are, are you you're are you referring to like the Egyptian postures using right. the pharaoh rods? Yeah. Well, yes. I didn't have any rods, but I just tried it without it. You know. Oh yes, see. yes. The the truth is is that we are all out of balance, like every single one of us. We have to accept that <laughs> we're <laughs> okay. all out of balance. And once we start to do these practices, especially doing uh, practices like Qigong um, or the Egyptian postures, what's going to start to happen is you're trying to um, shift and expand and strengthen your electromagnetic fields of your body. And we get into these patterns. We all have patterns. And these patterns hold us um, not only in um, energetic structures, but it keeps us on this right path in our life. And once we start to use Qigong, we're actually shifting our electromagnetic structure itself. And when we're doing that, um, a lot of different changes are going to start to happen. Uh, many people, when they start to practice these type of uh, meditations, um, they may feel dizzy or nauseous, or they may even start to like spin. I see a lot of people like spinning in different directions uh, or shaking. That's how I felt. I was I was shake, especially like it felt like the ground was shaking underneath me, so to speak. Wow, wow. And what I would just say is that these are the energy fields um, trying to um, equalize what you're doing, so it doesn't. Um, so it changes you in the way 
that is supposed to alter the energetic fields in a way that's going to be safe for you and not too drastic. Um, you have to make sure you're drinking a lot of water. And you also have to monitor yourself because you are the best judge of how you feel. Yeah. So some people are very, very sensitive to Qigong energy. And, you know, they'll just do a little and they'll feel like it's the biggest energetic release or transformation just by doing a little Qigong. So you really have to monitor mon monitor yourself and make sure that you're not um, pushing yourself too hard. So um, if I were you, I would just continue. And if you start feeling like the shaking, you could just sit down and ground yourself. Uh, just make sure you're you're not drinking uh, sugary substances. Oh, come on. Like, you got me there. You're talking to me at break, you know. <laughs> yeah, I see what you're doing. Uh, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> That's a sign uh, of a good just, friend right there. I'm going to call you out on the air, brother. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> well, yeah, I, just because um, water um, is very, very important for the electromagnetic fields of the body. Very, very important. Like the water and the minerals in the body. And when we are uh, have too much sugar, um it's um you may have these jerky reactions when gotcha. it comes to meditation or um qigong that makes sense that makes total sense i just got a real hang up for sweet to you too i don't know if i'll be able to let that one go maybe i could find a better sugar replacement for the tea huh um stevia there's there are some good stevia products out there that i've been using and i've I basically I don't I'm off sugar or try to be off sugar as much as I possibly can. But um no you can do it. I forgot about sweet tea. We don't have sweet tea here. Canada doesn't you don't have sweet tea? I think sweet tea kind of stops past the Mason Dixon line, actually. I, I think I, it does. I think it does too. I think that's a southern thing and I'm okay with that. You know, I've been southern shamed quite a bit here lately and I feel like <laughs> I'm just gonna stick up for us southern folk. But, uh, you know, um, yeah, it's something that I've drank since I was a kid, but, uh, I, well, we have, I'll just say that like in Canada, if you go to the convenience store and get a tea, it's, it's extremely sweet. Like yeah. all tea is sweet in here. When you go to Japan, on the other hand, you go to the convenience store, there's a, like a thousand teas in, in the convenience store in Japan and they're all bitter. There's not like one with sugar in it. Really? Because, yeah, because um, it's a totally different experience of tea over there. You don't want a sugary tea. You want to drink tea for health. So it's usually bitter. And, you know, they, they advertise what herbs um, are or what leaves are on that tea because it's healthy for you. Yeah. So it's a completely like different <laughs> consciousness. It's, it's good for you. It's good for you. Yeah. That's what they say. It's good for you. But you know what? Well, yeah. uh, speaking of the South, you I know for a fact you, you get some of the best crystals that you've ever had from this place. From, we're sitting on a quartz mine down here. You've got you've gotten a few crystals from here, haven't you? I have Arkansas quartz from Mount Ida right here on my desk right now. Best on the planet, right? Um, it is the best. So here's what I'm going to do. For the people out here that think crystals are extremely woo-woo, right? Because we got these people that believe that there is absolutely no reason for crystals. They do nothing for you. And I'm not asking you to prove it to them, but I feel like I'm in a courtroom with these people right now. And you're the. if I had to pick one person, I'd say that's the guy I'd want to pick. Uh, I, I don't know how scientific Jason's going to get with you, but in layman's terms, you've made more sense to me about crystals than anybody I've talked to. Well, let, let's just go back to the basics of why you even have uh, mining of crystals in Arkansas is because in World War I, um, they looked for the purest, sorts of, uh, purest source of quartz in America for their walkie-talkies and radios. And that was in Arkansas. That's right. So the first mines to, to take out these crystals in Arkansas was for the military purposes. And till this, uh, we still have 
quartz uh, crystals in uh, communication devices, GPS, satellites, and um, it comes from Arkansas. So at a scientific level, um, quartz absolutely does something because it's being used in our technology. Now, a quartz has a very interesting um, thing about it. It's called uh, piezoelectric uh, energy. And when a quartz has a little pressure on it, it will release electrons in what we call universal standard time vibration. So it has a frequency. Quartz has a very pure frequency. And that's why it's used um, in um, the tips of a record player is a tiny little quartz. And as it goes over the grooves, it creates uh, an electrical current from the pressure of the needle going over the grooves. And that sends a signal to the amplifier, and that's how you hear music. You take a crystal, and uh, you um, a crystal can pull the energy, the electromagnetic fields, the radio waves out of the air and transduce it into signal, an electrical signal that you can amplify and now have radio. So scientifically, a course is an amazing thing. Now, for a human being, what do you think your nails, hair, and skin have in it? And most of your organs, it's silica. You have the same things going through your physical body. You have a resonance, a frequency that the silicon dioxide molecules in your body will resonate to. So you can also pick up frequencies in the atmosphere using what you have naturally, which is the your skin, your hair, and your nails, and also your organs has a lot of silica. Um, we are connected through the minerals. So if you're meditating with a quartz crystal, what are you doing? It's the same thing as a radio. You're tapping in to an electrical field, an electromagnetic field, and if you're sensitive enough, you can start to feel that energy or frequency that's being amplified by that crystal. Is that an okay explanation? <laughs> that, that I mean, that works because, I mean, also there's the uh, personal experience that you can't discount either, right? And what I'm trying to do is uh, is decipher what is psychosomatic versus what's really working. Now, I'm not saying don't use crystals, even if they are psychosomatic. But what I've found is in a lot of these conferences, I'll give you an example, and maybe you can help me with this too. And mm-hmm. all of us have run into this, Jason, every one of us. When you go into a conference, there's several healing booths. Now, I am not the judge of what's right and what's wrong, and uh, but I have seen people try to convince friends and loved ones of stuff that just isn't there. And uh, you walk up to this booth, and they've got, let's just say, bracelets, right? And they do the the whole, well, stand on one foot and hold your arm out. And they push your arm down. And if it resists any difference, then that means that bracelet is worth $175. Now, um, I think that's BS. I'm sorry. I think it's a trick. I think it's psychosomatic. What do you think? And I'm, I know you're going to be gentle and compassionate about it. I'm just telling you, I think it is. I'll, I'll just say something else is that, um, you know, when you go to one of these tables and, you know, the person at the table will hand you a crystal and say, if you buy this crystal, it's going to open your third eye. You know, <laughs> yeah, yep. it's it may for some people, but the majority of the people, it won't. So it's false advertising. And I would say a crystal has to call you. And when someone says, how do I know which crystal to to get? It's the one you're drawn to first. Like literally, it's the one you're attracted to. And for some reason you like it, so you buy that crystal. You put it on your desk, on your nightstand. You can meditate with it. And then it comes to your personal experience. So somebody could hold a crystal and they can actually feel tingling in their hand, like the yeah. crystal has some type of vibration or it's alive. They could hold a crystal and they can feel sensations throughout the body. So this is not like a, a psychosomatic thing, like they're they're experiencing something by touching a crystal. And sometimes, um, and this has happened to me multiple times over my life, not every time, 
but a couple times, I'll hold a crystal in a meditation and it'll induce a visionary state. It'll induce some type of journey or message or vision. And yeah. I know that by holding that crystal was the activator for me to have that experience. Of course. It doesn't, it doesn't happen all the time, but it has happened. What so be, well, yeah, the crystals on. are fine though. I'm with you on that brother. It's the other yeah. stuff, you know, like I think they're well, doing a disservice to folks like you and others that are really trying to help people with these things, you know, but when I say the other stuff, I'm talking about the miraculous copper bracelet thing that's supposed to keep you on balance and all this stuff. Uh, and they, well, he, they do the one he, foot on one head and hold your, you know, rub your belly, pat your head trick. Yes. And I, I, believe and you know a lot of people will jump on this statement but what i believe is that your consciousness is more powerful than these objects and that it's a it's a, like the same thing as the placebo effect um you're you know the person is selling a product knowing that and believing that this is going to help the person and just by having that in the awareness and knowing that you're holding something that should be beneficial for you, your body will show that strong response to it. Uh -huh. So it is psychosomatic, but that doesn't mean it's a bad thing, right? That's um, right. Kind of like uh, the way we talk about symbols here. You know, we use exactly. symbols for all types of things, protection and uh, uh, all kinds of things. And yes, it's psychosomatic. It works on the collective unconscious too, but we know that. And that's okay. You can program. I would say you could program using your faith and your will and your belief that this object, like, you know, we can call them sacred amulets um, that could hold magical powers. You know, you can put that life force energy into it and, and know that this object will have, let's say, this protection effect or this healing effect or this uh, energy effect. And with that type of consciousness placed in that object, you are giving it power. Um, so if you did that and you handed that object to somebody, absolutely it will have an effect. Absolutely it will have an effect. But again, if you know someone comes up to you and you know the way that your mind works is like this is you know garbage yeah, and they're right. pulling a tr they're pulling a trick on you uh -huh. with with that mindset going forward into that situation you won't have a positive effect right with that stuff that's why when people say well the, you know they tell me the amazing randy he proved this wrong and that wrong i'm like well if you take a skeptic i mean a true skeptic and put them in any situation uh, you see the the magic of things, the, what you're talking about, how this person's belief and will that none of this stuff is real, it, it doesn't become real in their scenario ever. You know, it's always it's, something else. And, you know, <laughs> I don't want to, you know, make fun of this because it's, it's like if you go on the internet and, and look up these, um, like, let's say Qigong masters who, you know, they put their hands up and like, their followers are all jumping like up and down and falling over I've like they're, yeah. they're manipulating the energies. And then that same Qigong master will go to a bunch of people in a karate class <laughs> and try to do the same thing. And they just get punched in the face. I'm sorry. I laugh at those videos. I can't help it. I feel sorry for some of those people I because, do, but because, like um, when you're tuned in and tapped into this, um, that energy will affect you. Mm -hmm. But if it's not in your consciousness at all um, and you're not open to it, um, that you could have a difficult time receiving that energy. So don't you, th so then wouldn't you agree? Cause I've seen this in magic too, right? Yeah. So wouldn't you agree that the way the universe is set up in this plane is it's always, it's set up based on what we believe. I, w I would say that the belief um, sets the connection to the energy field. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes so, sense. So, for example, 
um, there are things energetically that can affect us no matter if we believe in it or not. Let's just put that out there. So there are things that can um, be beneficial for us and not beneficial for us. It doesn't matter what our beliefs are in it. It's the same thing as like jumping off a bridge. If you jump off a bridge, the laws of the universe, doesn't matter what you believe, you're going to hit the ground. <laughs> you know? That's right. Yeah. So there is things that can affect us. But remember, a lot of these uh, objects, these these um, they may have an effect. For example, like I sell the copper and zinc bracelets mm -hmm. off my website. And there is something to do when you take copper and zinc and put it together. Uh, it's dissimilar metals. It creates a milliamp of electricity naturally just yes. by having those those metals together. When you're putting that on your wrist, um, you're getting a flow, almost like a piezoelectric effect of ions entering your body. And we know that that has a physiological effect, a scientific physiological effect of calming down the nervous system, relieving aches and pains, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And they, they've known about that for thousands of years. It's just common knowledge. But if you're taking that copper bracelet now and infusing it with the belief in consciousness that it could do something more then that's you're adding that next level of i would call it magic to it gotcha yeah see ronnie mcmullen talks about this too with the supplements right um mm -hmm. he's got a video on this actually where he says you know if you take the tea or you take anything uh any one of his products and you have the mindset that it's not going to work. Supplements don't work or whatever. Then your body will react. I mean, literally react in a negative way towards it. Right. But if you take in the medicine or the alternative medicine or whatever you want to call it and accept that it's healing you and really believe that it's healing you, then he says that it even has a greater effect than it normally would is what he's noticed with people. Yeah. Pretty interesting. And it's very interesting. And look at, um, <laughs> Look at the uh, vaccine results of the flu vaccine. You know, like uh, the average flu vaccine, uh, it's, what is it? It's less than 10% effective right. with people. Well, if it's less than 10% effective, could we also just say that it's the placebo effect? And the people that it's helping are the people that believe it's helping? <laughs> yeah, see, that's, the, man... I don't know. The placebo effect is not, people talk about it like it's a medical condition, but I actually think the placebo effect is, is the universe trying to show us something like our own power right in front of our own eyes for once. Right. right. And we won't like, accept it. It's got to be something medically messed up that we don't understand. You it's know? like somebody getting a sugar pill and they heal themselves of cancer because they believe that they're actually taking the medicine. And then they just say, Oh, it's the placebo effect. Who cares if it's the placebo effect? It's the magic, person baby. healed. <laughs> yeah. It healed. The person healed. Yeah. Isn't that better than taking the medication? <laughs> Absolutely. Is that, is that more powerful than taking the med medication? That's way more powerful because you don't have to take a medic medication. It's just the power of the mind. All right, so let's take that into the scary stuff that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Can you use that power? Because I've been, I'm fascinated with placebo and nocebo and how to tap into it, um, especially with like in the laws of magic and stuff. Can you use that, let's say, to negate an entity or an enemy or something that's trying to vamp off you or a loved one? Can you use that power in the astral realm or does it not work that way? in those realms it works better in those realms and like i tell people for example if something is trying to let's say vamp off you or or hurt you in some way or even fight you in your mind you have to know that you are stronger than this and this thing is like a joke you have to know this in your mind and when you know this in your mind You've already won the battle, literally. If 
you're getting attacked and you're like, oh my God, I'm powerless, I'm weak, this thing is going to hurt me, I'm going into fear, you're giving this thing so much more energy going into that mindset. Yeah, it's like one that feeds off the next. You know, I I agree with just about everything you say, and I've also learned, you know, I've learned a bunch talking to you tonight about some of the stuff that I'm dealing with once again and some of the things that I believe that I might need to take another look at um and it's always a learning experience having you on here man it really is you know and i appreciate you coming on i would like to take a moment now to for anybody that doesn't know who jason is uh to talk about your books and your first book is forbidden knowledge which is the one i absolutely fell in love with where you really open up um it's like a prized possession book to me actually where you really open up about your experiences uh, with a friend of yours. And I'll let you speak on that, you know. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, Forbidden Knowledge, uh, Revelations of a Multidimensional Time Traveler. Um, it, it's basically a book of the all the experiences that I thought were um, necessary to tell people that have happened from pre-birth, pre, like pre-birth memories, past lives, to where I was currently, which was about, um, now I'm trying to remember when I released it. I think I was 33 years old or 34 years old. So from uh, my 20, entire life. 2013, and, wasn't it? Um, I think I released it um, 2015. I think that's when I came out. Oh, 14 or 15. I got it right here. Um, yeah, this is the book to get for Jason. Like if you want to know. What I don't know. Would you say this book puts you on the map? I mean, because when this book came out, I remember <laughs> seriously though. When this book came out, I think everybody and their brother was talking about you at the time. I I couldn't believe it because um, it was my first published book, and I didn't think it would go further than just a small crowd of people in Toronto, and you know, it came out and um, one of the first interviews that we had on it was with george nori on coast to coast mm -hmm. and once i released it on coast to coast um and i spoke on coast to coast almost every other station wanted to have me on to have a discussion and me and my uh, friend bob mitchell who's the co-author um we we were booked literally every single day almost we were booked every single day on the radio shows um discussing this book and it went almost international within the first couple months of being published. So, yeah, this is the book that really put me on the map. And I guess it was extremely relatable. Because when I wrote this book, I had all these uh, crazy spiritual experiences that I didn't think anybody had but me. <laughs> you know, I thought I was like alone in this world. Uh, dealing with these experiences. And I realized quite uh, fast that millions of people have experienced these things exactly the same way that I have, but they just never talked about it. They kept it in and they didn't want to tell their friends or family about it. So by coming out and literally just talking completely openly about these experiences, I got a huge huge fan base all around the world because it was very relatable to people and they were just waiting for someone to talk about these things. Yeah. And <clears throat> Bob Mitchell played a big role in that. I think too, wouldn't you say like introducing your story to everybody? Cause I was going through <clears throat> some introductory things when it came to the out of body experience, like my first experiences that, that I ever had. It's that phase, that first th phase when you go through jason when you're like you know holy shit this is real i mean yeah. this is this is not like i thought this wasn't real but it is real and you get all excited about it and about that time a buddy of mine dave cruz came to me and said have you heard of this jason quit guy you need to talk to him and as soon as i even had a notion of talking to you there you were bam coast to coast fade to black i mean just getting uh, just getting tossed around on every radio show there is and I think the reason why that is is because deep down, no matter what you believe about this, uh, deep down, I think we all kind of know that it's real and we all want this experience, you know. 
Yeah. And, you know, I was very fortunate to have someone like Bob Mitchell who was already on the scene. He already was friends with all the different uh, radio personalities uh, because he had a very long career uh, at the Toronto Star up in, in Canada as a crime and sports writer. So he was very involved in media. Um, so he basically picked me up, put me right in all these places to allow this message and these stories to reach um, a large amount of people. And unfortunately, uh, Bob passed away a couple months after this book was released, which is just insane in my mind to even think about that, that, you know, we had such a short time together and the profound impact that he had on my life. Um, it changed my life, him coming and helping me do this. And once he passed away, it was like um, I still had to go forward without him, uh, which was very difficult to do. But it just it gave me that confidence to continue to do the radio shows and continue to get out there uh, and stand on my own two feet. But if it wasn't for Bob, you know, you wouldn't even know my name. And then you did the Egyptian postures of power, both for the the sun and the moon uh, books, which uh, are fascinating. You kind of hinted towards <clears throat> that in this book. Uh, but um, one I'm really interested in that I haven't read yet is the Yosef Codes. And even on all of your books, you have these, uh, what I would call, I don't know if I would call them mandalas, but they look like geometric portals. That's what they look like. And, yeah. And- uh, is that what they are? Yeah, that's exactly what they are. They're um, mandalas using sacred geometry based off of the flower of life and the platonic solids. And uh, basically, this was a, um, a type of healing meditation using mandalas to get into the right vibration or frequency or to train the mind into a state of calmness while gazing at the structure of the sacred geometry design to put you in connection with those frequencies or altered states. So um, that's the reason I wrote that book originally. And I know I haven't really been promoting this book too much because it is very um, esoteric. Um, you know, I really believe that sacred geometry is a doorway to other dimensions, other worlds. And there's a, a spiritual science about them. And basically, it's based off of the whole concept of mandalas, where they would create these beautiful mandalas in all different types of cultures. And by being in rooms with them to meditate with them, it could shift your energy or put you in an altered state or connect you with the energies that you need at that point in your life. So um, I do believe that there is a power within sacred geometries that are based off of the universal laws of symmetry. Um, and I use them all the time. And they've but, enhanced your life, obviously. I mean, you're in, in my mind and in many other people's mind, you're a successful author, a successful speaker. Um, I would even say entrepreneur and uh, you seem like you're always a happy, positive individual. And I can tell everybody off air, he's not much different than he is right now. You know, he, this is who he is. And I respect that a lot. I really do. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for coming on again, man. It, it's really cool to have you back on the show. Thank you. And you know, it, it's funny to talk about, you know, these books because I really don't advertise them. And people are like, well, you're very bad at business because you're not advertising yeah, <laughs> what right. you do and what your books are. But for me, it's like, if you're called to that information, you're going to find that book. I don't need to advertise or, or talk about these things. You're going to find it because you're drawn to it. Absolutely. But yeah. And I am, it's all, uh, I'm drawn to this information. I, what I want to do though, I want to make sure that this YouTube channel comes into manifestation, man. Is this like a guaranteed thing that you're going to do? Sorry to interrupt you, but I only got a couple of minutes. I got to know. Um, I would say it's a hundred percent guaranteed because that's the way everything is moving. And, um, I have the equipment, I have the know-how 
And I have a lot of friends that are supporting me in this. Yep. So right now I cannot say no. It's happening 100%. Now that's, yeah. And if you need anything from us, we'll back you too, for sure, man. In every way possible, Jason. And the, and the only warning I have to give to people is it's YouTube. So I can basically do whatever I want. So one day <laughs> we might be talking about spiritual philosophy. The next episode might be a joke. The next episode might be about how to use certain musical gear. It's completely whatever I want <laughs> at that That's time. Beautiful. So beautiful, we can man. go to many areas of research. Yeah. That's fantastic. Jason, thanks for coming on. Give him a follow on Facebook. You got the Crystal Sun page on Facebook too, right? Uh, I do. You can check out. Oh, yes. The Crystal Sun on Facebook. All you have to do is type in Jason Quit, uh, the Crystal Sun, and that will come up on Facebook. And I'm Jason underscore Quit, Q-U-I-T-T, on uh, Twitter. And my website is thecrystalsun.com. Absolutely. You guys go check that out. He's got a blog on there. It gets good information all the time on the Facebook page. He's always putting up good, positive memes. You're not going to catch anything negative coming out of this guy right here. And you can learn quite a bit from listening to Jason. Thanks again for coming on, man. Thanks for having me. Guys, please don't copy the show without written permission on YouTube. Don't do it. And uh, the show is produced by The Fringe FM tomorrow night. Alex Sakars from Skeptico will be on. <clears throat> excuse me. We'll be on the broadcast. And I want to thank Don, Pacho, uh, Dennis, uh, Eric Markham, Jeremy Scott. Thank you all in the chat room. Nick, thanks for coming out and seeing me. Uh, Sammy, thanks for coming out and seeing us. We'll see you guys tomorrow night. Good night. Discretion is advised.